So for those of you that uh, might have missed my panel presentation this morning, I said, uh, how many of you, I asked how many of you have seen Brad, the Brad Pitt movie Fight Club? And so, you know, the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club, right? But in Korea, we talk about being able to fight tonight and the readiness to fight tonight. And so I, I say, don't talk about fight tonight unless you're ready, unless you're ready to win. And so it's important that our day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month preparations make sure that we're ready. And so why do we need to be ready? I, I recently, I use, it's the only chart that I normally ever use when I talk about. And it says Northeast Asia, and I just recently changed it uh, and included Taiwan, but I'm, Taiwan's not in Northeast Asia. But I just look at the overlapping competition in Northeast Asia, whether it's China, North Korea, or Russia. They're all named adversaries within our U.S. national defense strategy. Yet we've got great allies there. We've got the Republic of Korea, we've got Japan, and all kinds of other countries throughout Southeast Asia. But when you look at the world, and this portion of the world, there's a lot going on right now. And it only takes just a quick look at the news to understand the day-to-day -day competition which is going on. We saw yesterday Kim Jong-un took his daughter to work day. And it was, uh, I think, what they think will be a satellite launch. Well, I think we all know that the missile technology for launching a satellite into high Earth orbit is the same technology that it takes to put an intermediate range or inter not an intercontinental ballistic missile. His testing this year has been unprecedented. Although it's been quiet the last three weeks, it's without precedent. When we look at the actions of the Chinese Communist Party as well, as it relates to the region and the rest of the world, it's concerning. And of course, Russia's actions in Ukraine have put the world on edge as Ukraine fights for its freedom. So 73 years ago, the Republic of Korea was in a fight for its freedom when North Korea invaded unexpectedly. And the United States and 22 other countries, United Nations sending states came. And you look at it now, uh, people call it the miracle on the Han. Seoul, it's not a miracle. It's hard work, not just from the Koreans, but also with help from others. And so I think when you see at what happened in Korea 73 years ago, the importance that this area is to the region, and then you think about what's happening in Ukraine, we want peace. We want peace throughout the region, and we want stability. And we do this through training and our operations with our allies and partners. Uh, the video that, that you just saw, for those of you that just saw it, with the exception of the black and white footage from uh, years ago, all the color footage was within the last year. That's real, live, combined training that's going on between the Republic of Korea and the United States forces. And it's inherently joint as well. You saw Army helicopters landing on Navy ships. You saw Korean uh, indirect fire as part of a U.S. Uh, combined arms live fire. You saw an American striker brigade offloading off of a ship. These are all things that are happening right now because if you look at, and not just look at the region, but it goes back to, uh, we, had, we had the USS Ronald Reagan visit the port of Busan, I don't know, six, eight months ago. And the Ronald Reagan came in there, and, and their motto as an aircraft carrier stems from one of Ronald Reagan's speeches that I think he gave in probably around May of 1981. Um, and he used the words, peace through strength. And so the Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier sort of carries that as their motto. When you look at the Rock us alliance and what we are doing within Northeast Asia, it is about maintaining the peace through strength, through our combined readiness. And as you look at the other allies and partners that are on there, specifically Japan, I think you've seen in the last few weeks uh, an increased desire both politically, diplomatically, 
and militarily for additional strength between the Republic of Korea, the United States, and Japan as we continue to build strength uh, in Northeast Asia. And so as I, as I wrap up here, I'm going to turn it over to Command Sergeant Major Cobb, who will talk a little bit more about his perspective and those things that are in uh, the Republic of Korea and our combined defense, and then we'll take questions. So over to Sergeant Major Cobb. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for taking your time to come listen to us for a little bit and learn a little bit more about the Korea Peninsula and what we have going on uh, in the Republic of Korea with our partners. So uh, you see the map behind us there has all of our, our adversaries that are working in the area every day, working in the gray area to build capacity, build their arsenals, and build their capabilities against us. But we know we work stronger and we're stronger together when we work with our partners. Uh, the way we do that in 8th Army is, you know, two ideas combined division. Um, the, the only really truly divine division, combined division in the Army. And our non-commissioned officer and junior leaders really build that capacity doing such things as rotations out at the Korean Combat Training Center. We started that off with this at the platoon level and we have continued to grow that um, out there at the training center to company and now battalion level task force that our ROC and uh, coalition part Army forces are working together at those training centers learning these service TTPs and how we conduct missions. We then expand that out to live fire exercises. You've seen some of that on the screen there. One of those that you saw was up at the JSA. That was a joint live fire between uh, Rock Infantry Platoon and our JSA elements up there. We just com completed a combined live fire exercise out at Rodriguez. That was K-1 tanks, Korean tanks, their engineer forces out there hitting the breach with us and then our striker infantry going on and assaulting the objective. So that's kind of how we build the capacity with our coalition partners. We also do um, instructor exchanges. So we'll send American instructors over to their academies uh, to construct, instruct there. And then we'll also receive some of their instructors at our BLCs and then our Katusa training academies. All of our Katusas that are assigned down to the squad, platoon, and company level all across 8th Army go through this training academy to kind of align them with some of the same training that American forces do before they reach their unit of assignment. So it's very helpful just to bind our cultures together, help us understand each other a little bit more, um, and make it, that bond even stronger um, with our ROC partners. We're continuing to expand this out um, with our ROC non-commissioned officers, and especially our Command Sergeant Majors and the ROC Army. Um, Command Sergeant Major Love at USFK gets us together around four times a year uh, to do events like Mungadai. Those are absolutely leadership challenges that are all master sergeants and command sergeant majors and we go out and we run through troop leading procedures together to show them how we execute those and then we come together during our Freedom Shield exercises to go out and actually visit those nodes that we'll be operating uh, and to do a NEO evacuation exercise or to do combined operations. And we actually get on the ground that we would be fighting and operating <coughs> on and walk through those techniques and procedures so we make sure we have a clear understanding from both sides of how we would operate in those environments. So when we say that we're you know, training to fight the night, it's not just a bumper sticker. And we do everything we can to uh, continue to expand that capacity um, every day. We just recently started alerts that are assisted by um, our staff at the 8th Army level with our G3, G3 Sergeant Major, they go out and do a no-notice alert with a company. They pick a company within 8th Army, they alert that company, and then they basically go out and give them a grade on their report card, on alert procedures, assembly, draw, dispatch, and prepare to move to make sure we can laser focus on those elements that we need to make sure we can alert quickly and then move out to our assembly areas to get ready to assist in the mission that we, we may be doing. So uh, we're very proud of the efforts that we're doing, but we're not going to be uh, sit back on our laurels and think we're where we need to be at. We have to constantly continue to improve every day. And myself and General Burleson are very proud of the steps that 8th Army and 2ID have taken in the last few years, and they're continuing to build upon that capacity. So thank you for uh, your time, and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Um, I mean, I... I honestly think as we look at how we develop new capabilities, whether it's direct, indirect fires, directed energy, whether it's cyber, EW, any of the other multiple domain things, we got to look at it from a doctrinalization, training, leader development, material personnel. So great opportunities here for 
you know, to look at technological advances. But if we don't have the other pieces that go with it, you know, it's just like I'm giving you a new hammer, right? You're gonna use it the same way. Some things, um, when you look at high energy lasers, uh, and I think about like a capability like that, what I'm thinking as an infantryman is, what's the range fan, right? What's the range fan? How do I protect myself? How do I protect others? And how do I eliminate the threat uh, that I'm trying to neutralize? And so I think we can answer those questions pretty quickly. That's science, right? But then what does it mean for how we fight? How does it fundamentally change how we fight or employ fires? I think we got to look at it in total. Good capabilities, we just got to understand what it means total for us in everything. No, so what, what's interesting, you know, we went to uh, IPAMS here last year, right? And we had uh, forces from all across the Pacific come together. And all the start majors got together. And we thought we were going to be very unique in our problem sets that we had. Well, believe it or not, we have the exact same problem sets across all the armies, right? And when it comes to non-commissioned officers, it's, you know, making sure we get the right training resources for one. Two, they're trained. Three, um, instilling standards and discipline within our young soldiers, right? Because when I was growing up, I didn't ask why. I just, okay, you want me to dig the foxhole? I'm going to dig it. How deep you want it? How wide do you want it? I got it. And now it's, hey, we need to go dig some foxholes, fill some sandbags. This is how deep and wide, but why? Why does it have to be this deep? Why does it have to be this wide? So it's bridging that communication. I'm not going to say gap. It's that communication difference now between the generations. How do we communicate with the younger generations and be effective in doing it? It's those still same problems, right? Even in the Rock Army. And, you know, we look at our, um, you know, we'd say the Rock Army is a conscript army and they only have them for about two years. Well, if you look at us in the American Army in Korea, we really only have them for about a year because they are for a one year rotation, right? So, how do we optimize that training cycle to get the most training and the most value added training in that period of time to make them as competent as we can be? So, we just have to have a very focused, um, laser focused training plans um, and make sure we're giving our non commissioned officers the time to execute those training plans. But believe it or not, you know, language difference, cultural difference, you put two NCOs together, uh, very, very similar problems and very uh, similar successes. They're great non commissioned officers. They just have to have the tools they need to execute the training we're asking them to do, right? So, very good non commissioned officers on the rock side. Uh, so, General Eifer's question, how do we maintain our interoperability between uh, the U.S. and the Republic of Korea? So, I, I look at interoperability, really three things, human, procedural, and technical. They will continue, will continue to chase uh, the chihuahua around of technical interoperability, right, as we try and get our networks to talk. We do have Centrix K, which is our combined network. Uh, tactical voice bridging allows us to potentially be able to speak to each other. But remember, we've got to understand each other, right? I mean, I've seen it where Americans and British can't understand each other. And we speak a common language, supposedly, right? So I'm always a little bit suspect of when I just hear the technical solutions. I'm actually a much strong believer in human procedural. And what I believe we're able to do better than anybody else is we have developed over 50, 70 years a series of crisis action standard operating procedures. So if one of them is how to tie your shoe, right? There's a quick reference sheet that's one sheet that says how to tie your shoe. And behind that, there's a phone book of all the things you got to do. Now, we don't have one for tying our shoes, but whether it's calling for fire, uh, elevating what, our security threats. So the work has been done ahead of time procedurally. It's been agreed upon. We've translated it, retranslated it, translated it back to eliminate ambiguity. So all we got to say is execute this crisis action SOP at this time. Everybody pulls it out. There's no ambiguity. Human interoperability, um, well, I think there's, there's a lot of things that are important on this. Is First of all, we're fortunate that we have the Korean augmentation of the United States Army program. And, you know, as the Korean Army changes its size and structure, so do our Katusas. But they're embedded within our formation. Some of these are kids working on college degrees at Oxford. I mean, their, their English is better than mine. And they provide that language interoperability. I think we're also fortunate that the Republic of Korea 
has one of the highest, per, maybe perhaps the highest per capita number of young adults that go to the United States for education. So English as a language in Korea has become much more prolific. So the average Korean can, can speak some Korean. Uh, but more importantly, to underscore it all, is our day-to-day -day combined training. I mean, this can't be one of these things where you show up for a training exercise and go, let's figure out how to be interoperable. I mean, 2ID is doing bridge crossings. That's one of the most complex operations that we have, doing a bridge crossing in a combined unit. Uh, we have the Korean Combat Training Center, which is a Korean Combat Training Center, much like our Joint Readiness Training Center, National Training Center, the one we got in Hohenfels. Now that we have a striker brigade, we've embedded a striker battalion with a Korean regiment in KCTC. So you got a battalion, U.S. battalion commander, a thinking staff that now is part of that Korean staff that just, it improves our interoperability every single day. So I, I'd say it's, it's not episodic, it's day to day and it's continuous. It's like being a lineman on a football team, contact all the time. And that's what builds our interoperability. And sir, if I could add to that, you know, we got to keep talent on the team, right? You hear General Flynn talking about bringing folks back to the Pacific, right? Um, you know, I go out to Sergeant Majors Academy. We go out to Leavenworth every year, and we talk to our folks coming in, and we hope that they come accompanied, right? Because, you know, it's a little selfish, right? Because we want to keep it for two years. But every single time the families get over there, they love it, and they don't want to leave. And we have to tell that story so we continue to get our talent back to Korea. Uh, Korea is not the Korea of old. You're not hurting for anything. Camp Humphreys is one of the newest installations in the United States Army, right? Everything's new. Um, the subway systems, you hop on the subway or the train system, and you're up in Seoul in two hours. Go have a nice day, come on back down to Humphreys. So the country is a very developed country. We're not hurting for anything. Families absolutely love it. Uh, and when they get over there, um, you'll find most of the time they won't, won't leave. But we get that talent on the team, and then we keep getting the repeat offenders, right? They get back and they hadn't forgot all that knowledge they had the last time they were there. They're just bringing it back to the team, they're re-bluing it and see how they can plug right back into the team and keep fighting again. It's my third time there, right? And every single time I've come back, I've seen how much progress we've made, how much we've improved our combined fighting force together. Uh, and it's, it, it's pretty impressive. Um, so we invite everybody that's out there on the ask cycle to put your name in the hat and come on to Korea and join uh, a winning team where you're actually going to do your job. Our intel folks, our, uh, you know, our air traffic controllers, you know, all those folks, they're doing their real job every single day. They got a real target, a real enemy. They're not fighting the Atropians down in JRTC, right? So come do your real job and join the team over in Korea and uh, learn how to fight at night, right? Thank you for coming to AUSA and coming here for our little commander's corner. Uh, and I wish you a great lunch. Thank you very much. I'm Brian Martin. I'm the uh, commander of the uh, 196 Infantry, which forms the ops group for the Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center, JPMRC. And uh, thanks for being here this afternoon to hear about the center and the great work uh, that the team from uh, JPMRC does to put on training events. So. Uh, the Army's got three CTCs that they've had for the last 40-ish years or so, and uh, we are just now kind of putting the final touches on the fourth uh, combat training center uh, that the Army's built. And we've built it out here in the Indo-Pacific, and we do three rotations a year. We do one here in Alaska, or one in Alaska, one here in Hawaii, and one west of the International Dateline. And the whole goal is to uh, keep forces in theater. So for a data point, uh, we save about 110 days of readiness where we're not sending forces back to the continental United States. Um, we're able to save about $80 million per rotation by keeping them out here and not having to ship everything back to, uh, to CONUS. But more importantly, we're able to work with our allies and partners here in theater uh, in the environment in which the USAR pack forces will, uh, will go ahead and, and deter and, if necessary, fight. And so we do that with, uh, with a fairly small footprint right now. And when we're fully built out, we'll be about 441 folks. We're, we're nowhere even close to that right now. 
We still rely on a lot of support from first core and from uh, other elements back in CONUS to execute each one of these rotations. Um, but, uh, but it's good work, and some of the team you see around here are, are the folks who carry the really, really heavy load of uh, making these rotations happen. So they're doing what a, what a team of about 800 folks do. Uh, they're doing it with about 100 folks uh, to make each one of these occur. And we are very log heavy since we uh, ship this system all over the Indo-Pacific. And so um, when we build readiness for forces here in theater, we're able to display a combat credible force in the environment in which they're gonna fight. So the 25th Infantry Division uh, my main job is to help that division commander train his brigade uh, in, in jungle warfare and in an island fight, which is something our military has is, is not really done uh, since the 40s. Uh, when we go to Alaska, I work with the 11th Airborne, and we train that brigade in how to fight in the Arctic, how to fight in extreme cold weather, and how to fight in the mountains. So when you kind of think you know, we never want to have a repeat of the Chosen Reservoir, the 11th Airborne is, is at the forefront in figuring out how to keep that from happening, right? How to actually thrive and, and survive, not just survive, but thrive and fight in the Arctic environment. And then when we go west of the International Dateline, those rotations are really focused on displaying a combat credible force alongside our ally and partner and, and showing the application of that readiness uh, forward. Uh, to date, we've had 16 observer nations come and uh, embed in the exercises, and we, are, we just finished our, our fifth exercise. So that's 16 different nations, with five exercises coming out and seeing kind of behind the curtain how we put on the exercise, the training value uh, to forces that would fight here in the Indo-Pacific. Eight of those nations have joined us uh, as either part of the rotational unit, uh, part of the OP4, or part of the exercise control. Um, and specifically, we have very, very close relationships with the Australian CTC, the Indonesian CTC, where we executed a rotation uh, two years ago. Um, next year, we'll be in the Philippines, so we're working with the Armed Forces of the Philippines CTC. And uh, for, for all things Arctic, we have a very, very close relationship with the Canadian CTC. When you hear about JPMRC rotations, anything with a Dash 01 is a Hawaii-based rotation working on the, the inter-island fight. And uh, anything with a dash zero two is the Alaska rotation, the Alaska fight. We also have uh, very close relationships and growing relationships with the CTC in Japan, the CTC in Korea, and um, uh, uh, the CTC in Singapore. That's just kind of beginning to, to, to uh, develop. Importantly, you know, these are all rehearsals uh, for, for you know, deterring conflict and uh, for the readiness that's built here in Hawaii, the readiness that's built in Alaska, when they deploy that forward west of the International Dateline, um, if something were to develop and there's a crisis underway, they've rehearsed how they would respond to that through JPMRC. So um, it is the 25th Infantry Division commander and 11th Airborne commander's way to validate their forces before they deploy forward. Let's go ahead, next slide. So as I said before, uh, up in Alaska, uh, we're figuring out how to fight in the Arctic, right? How uh, we've got an Arctic strategy. We don't really have any documentation on how to actually fight in the Arctic. And uh, the 11th Airborne's working on that. Their commander uses JPMRC as a way to do that at scale with uh, anywhere uh, between 5,000 to 8,000 people in the field. We had about 8,000 people this last rotation. Here in uh, Hawaii, we are living chapter seven of FN 3-0 which is the uh, Army operations in a maritime environment. So if you were to take that doctrine and you were to overlay it on our, our rotations, you can see it play out, right? And, and again, we are experimenting with uh, what does it take to sustain a force on an inter-island fight? Uh, how do Army forces in a maritime environment um, exercise sea control, ex execute uh, maritime domain awareness, and execute targets at sea. And we're working all of that out right now. Uh, uh, last rotation, we had a sensor to shooter exercise uh, in our, our live virtual and constructive wrap where we had a joint element, the 3rd Marine Littoral Regiment, which is executing their um, expeditionary advanced basing operations. 
uh, sent a, uh, a enemy DDG, passed that targeting off, data off to 25th Infantry Division, who passed it to 15th Wing, who then passed it to a Naval Strike Group 3 DDG at sea that executed the target. Um, and these are all kind of emerging concepts on, on how we're going to do joint all domain operations. We're exercising that here now in the Indo-Pacific with uh, our joint partners that we're surrounded by, right? So we don't have to go and ask uh, other joint partners to play. They, they're showing up. They want to be part of this. Um, for Army forces, especially Army forces early in crisis, it's only going to be joint partners around us, right? Until tip fit and forces flow into, into, uh, into theater. They're going to have, you know, a brigade that's forward is going to have to figure out how do they play with 15th wing, how do they interoperate with PAC fleet, and how do they work with uh, the Marines that are part of the stand-in force. Um, to kind of round all of this out, we're currently executing uh, high range operations where you put long-range precision fires on uh, Air Force aircraft, move them in from an off-axis uh, to allow them to uh, execute long-range uh, targets both in support of the, um, of the JFAC uh, and in support of, of Army uh, operations. We've uh, executed uh, GPS denial, RF jamming, um, a whole suite of small UASs, uh, kind of stuff you see in, uh, in the media from Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and importantly, we're teaching forces here how to use uh, extended sensing overhead SAR, overhead uh, EOIR as part of their operations process. And this works both ways. Uh, because we are replicating a near-peer adversary, the OP4 gets that as well. Um, so that, that's something new our forces uh, have to contend with, uh, especially guys my generation where we didn't really have to worry about the adversary having uh, SAR overhead of, of what our footprint might look like at any given point on the battlefield. We work closely uh, with 3rd MDTF as they're beginning to build their forces. They're embedded uh, in, uh, in our exercises. And uh, as you can see up here, uh, this is an upcoming exercise uh, that we'll execute in the Hawaiian Islands, out in Guam, Midway, Johnson Atoll, Wake Island uh, this upcoming fall. 3rd uh, MDTF will move out with a package from 25th ID uh, to execute some of their uh, extended range sensing some of their electronic attack, electronic warfare capability, and long-range precision fires out of Guam. At the same time, uh, marine elements led by the Marine Air Group out of Kanahoe Bay will um, move to uh, uh, Midway and execute some of their uh, uh, EABO. And 15th Wing will ex execute uh, their uh, uh, agile combat employment uh, out of Wake Island as a C2 element for kind of a replicated uh, reinforcement of a first island chain, if you will. While that's occurring back on the Hawaiian uh, main archipelago, uh, we're going to be conducting uh, decisive uh, land operations in a maritime environment as a 25th ID uh, secures uh, islands uh, that, are, that are replicating a, a, a U.S. Uh, treaty ally that's uh, asked for help in restoring their national sovereignty. And we're really going to experiment with, with how do we do sustainment of a fight uh, between islands and how do we move army forces on an inner island fight. Um, we're, not, we're not allowing them to prepo anything on the big island. They're going to have to figure out how they're going to get from uh, the northern part of Oahu all the way to the big island and, and kind of culminate there. I don't want to give too much of it away uh, from a scenario development perspective. Um, so we're still growing the CTC. It is, um, it's up and running. It's been up since uh, 2022. As we said, we just executed our fifth uh, rotation. We'll execute a rotation in Australia uh, this upcoming uh, summer. Um, and uh, as we build this thing out, there's kind of five pillars that we're, we're building the training center out around. The first one, the operational environment uh, in the op, Op 4, the operational environment kind of sets itself. It's the Indo-PACOM uh, operational environment. Um, from an Op 4 perspective, we use the decisive uh, action, action uh, training environment, uh, Pacific, which is built around the Alvanian threat. That's the name of the, you know, for those of us who are Krasinovians back in the day, uh, Olvana is a threat that um, has us uh, with, a, with a larger population 
Um, they have us with um, longer range fires, more fires than we're used to, and they have us with tech that's as good, if not better than ours. Um, and we are all of Ana all the time. That's the only thing we focus on here, unlike some legacy CTCs that have to kind of mix in other threat templates. Um, and uh, under this model, uh, we don't have a permanent OP4. We have a kind of a permanent cadre of OP4 um, teachers that embed with a, uh, a unit uh, starting about three or four months out before the rotation and using ATP 7-100.3, which is the unclassified version of, of uh, the PLA threat tactics, uh, we go ahead and, and turn them into an opposing force. Uh, so this kind of creates a, uh, a, an understanding of the significant uh, adversary challenge in this area in, in the operating force. Um, and as everyone knows, when, when you get to play Op 4, uh, they play it with a degree of uh, gusto that uh, when you put a, a helmet on somebody in Miles gear and their morale just kind of plummets, they just don't have, you put a boonie cap in Miles gear on somebody and they, they really kind of get after it. And we've had very, very professional Op 4 out here uh, create dilemmas for, uh, for our training forces, for the rotational units. For the operations group, again, it's centered around the 196th Infantry Brigade. Um, when we're fully manned, which will be about 441 folks, uh, we're still only going to be half to one third the size of the other CTCs. And, and this is because we only execute three rotations a year. Um, and we don't need 800, 1200 people to execute back to back to back to back rotations. Um, so importantly, we are uh, very integrated with our multinational uh, partners. As I said before, we've had um, uh, the Australians have been inside our XCON. They've been op four for us. Uh, we've had Canadians that have been part of our OCT packages, uh, Indonesians who have been OCTs uh, with us, and, uh, and this summer will be, we'll be fully integrated with the Australian uh, CTC. And then more importantly, we're, uh, we're truly a joint operations group. So we've got Marine OCs that show up for these exercises. Uh, we've got the Air Force that's using something similar to an OC capability uh, for their exercise. And more importantly, the kind of the most important thing, um, you could do away with the rest of this stuff. And as long as you have a good OC who can sit down and observe, coach, teach, and mentor uh, a, a, a peer uh, as they work through a difficult problem set, uh, we're still going to get a lot of good training a lot, a lot of good uh, learning out of that training repetition. And uh, I would submit with what uh, the OCC out here in the Indo-Pacific, uh, with the problems folks have to work through out here, they're, they're not problems that we've had to grapple with over the last 20 years. Um, you know, how do you sustain, how do you move through mountainous jungle, right, and still just keep track of your frontline trace? Uh, how do you survive in the Arctic? Um, these are all things that ROCs are kind of experts on and really help their, uh, their partnered force, if you will, the force that they're OCing, make it through a rotation. And then most importantly, uh, the after action review where the real learning occurs. Um, my folks that are out here in white, they're, they're experts at doing it. Um, and uh, we deliver a really, really good product for the training brigades. For the rotational training units, uh, again, the brigade is kind of the center. It's the focus point for us, right? They're the ones that have to get out of uh, leave our training events with a heightened state of readiness. But uh, most importantly, uh, starting with our very first rotation, we use the division as the uh, higher command. Um, and so there's no 21st infantry or 52nd infantry where it's a guy like me who's dual hatting as, a, as the, uh, the ops group commander who's dialing the reestat of training. Uh, and as the commander, you know, the higher commander of the rotational unit. Uh, here it is the 25th Infantry Division commander. It's the 11th Airborne uh, commander who is executing those mission command functions um, for the training unit. And it, it's incredibly powerful to watch the division commander and the division staff work with the RTU commander, the brigade commander going through training, and the brigade staff, and then the battalions and all the uh, downtrace units that are going through the training and they're working through complex military problems and they're doing it in you know in the uh, crucible that's a CTC rotation it's an incredibly powerful thing to watch 
and uh, my peers the, who are going through the training have all come out of it and said, you know, that is, that, that's how you form tight teams. You, you know, you make people do hard things um, and uh, give them an opportunity to learn. And it's been an incredibly successful uh, training opportunity from, from that perspective. So Division HiCon, the brigade going through the training, and then we leverage the full suite of the uh, echelons above brigade that come out of first corps to execute these. So engineers, MP support, uh, medical support, third MDTF, and then General Flynn has kind of given direction to all of his um, major commands, and all of his direct report uh, units that they'll support this, right? So we've got uh, support from 8th uh, uh, TSC, from um, uh, Compo 2 and Compo 3 units coming out of 9th MSC, the Hawaii National Guard, the Guam National Guard, that all support these uh, rotations. Uh, huge support from 5th SVAB because of our multinational flavor uh, that come out to, uh, to enable this training and medical support from 18th MedCom. And so he's able to exercise various elements of the feeder army when these uh, rotations uh, go ahead and, and get executed. Everybody comes to the table with their own training objectives. Again, we put the primacy of the training objective on the brigade that's going through the training, uh, but everyone's able to walk away. And I check them every single day while we're going through rotation. How many training objectives are being achieved? What still has to be, you know, be hit uh, before the end of the rotation? And uh, we're, we're batting like 99% on, uh, on training objectives being met by you know, all echelons of units that show up for these. As I said earlier, we are surrounded by joint assets here in Hawaii, here in Indo-PACOM, uh, the US Indo-PACOM AOR. Uh, they show up with their own training objectives. And, and here's where the beauty of JPMRC really gets, gets to unfold. We're not paying $6 million to get the Air Force to show up to Fort Johnson in Louisiana to execute uh, training alongside an Army element at JRTC. They show up with their own training objectives here because we're in the environment they need to train in, we're the partner they need to train in, um, and we're executing the sort of operations they need help um, or that, that they have synergy with when we train together. And so they show up and they're paying their own flight hours, which if, if you've ever worked with the Air Force, right, flight hours are massively expensive. Um, they're accomplishing their own training objectives. The Navy's accomplishing their own training objectives as part of this, um, but it's, it's not coming on the, you know, the Army's dime, if you will, from a, from a training perspective. It's, it's huge. Um, and at the at kind of a tactical level, a lot of the joint interoperability that we de developed over the last 20 years of working together in, in various AORs, um, that's being sustained uh, by the touches that the brigade's getting with uh, the different air wings that show up, with the different naval strike groups that participate in this, and, and especially with our Marine Corps uh, elements here on island. And kind of the outer layer of all that is the allies and partners and our friends in the theater that show up for, uh, for training, again, with their own training events, training objectives that they need to hit, um, but they, uh, they all walk out of this uh, with, uh, with a higher proficiency from when they went in. And uh, we all get to learn from each other on, on how we operate um, and developing relationships you know, that are gonna last uh, careers as these things progress. From an instrumentation perspective, if you're familiar with the CTC, so we do the live virtual constructive, uh, we're able to replicate things that really aren't there because they're appearing on mission command systems uh, they're being injected through um, our instrumentation, and then the same instrumentation takes feedback so that we're able to provide good after action reviews on here's what really happened. Um, I'm able to take this anywhere in theater. We pack it up, it's about 26 Sealand containers, and we can move it. Uh, it's currently being moved from Alaska to Australia. Um, we are not fixed to a particular piece of terrain which gives, from a training perspective, gives you tons of options, right? And again, at guys at my level who've been at JRTC 15 times, like, they know the terrain, they know the fight, they know where the, the decisive terrain, you know, that they have to hold here is. Here we can switch it up on folks. And then uh, last, as I said, facilities, we're completely exportable. Uh, it's the beauty of the system. It's, uh, it's the beauty of the way this thing's been set up. It's, um, you know, USARPAC works out an agreement with a multinational partner and, and they want us in a country in a year from now, 
we start the planning 270 days out, we pack this thing up, we move it, and we go ahead and execute training. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Fifth SBAB said they were going to have some hard ones. You mentioned uh, the work. Thanks. Very helpful and insightful. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the work that you're able to do with the, the multinational training that, that we get at. Are there limitations for how many partners that, that we can bring into these different exercises? Yeah. So the question uh, was, are there limitations to um, how many multinational partners we can bring into the training? So there's, there's two limiting factors on that. The first one is terrain. Um, so in Alaska, uh, the sky's your limit. The training area is up there, the size of the state of Indiana. Um, so there's, there's a lot that you can do in Alaska. Um, on an island, there's limited training opportunities. And so um, um, right now, it's, it's about one partner for uh, each American maneuver element. So three like light infantry company size elements. Um, but there's room for everything that's not maneuver, right? So the other war fighting functions, um, the New Zealand contingent is bringing, um, they're bringing a field artillery element. Uh, up this year. So we're, we're at about capacity right now this year with about six partners that are going to show up for this next training event um, here in the fall. Um, and it's about, uh, we're at about 830 multinational uh, soldiers that will show up. That's, a, that's kind of about right for the Hawaiian Island uh, training scenario. Sir. Do you have a, um, a language or a cultural training component to this? So the question is if we have a language or cultural training component to this. Um, when I mentioned earlier that we, uh, we rely on uh, other uh, pack elements to help us with, put on these training events, um, one of the key partners for our, our multinational allies and partners, friends who show up, is the, is the fifth SVAB. And they kind of have that cultural uh, experience to a degree, they, they may have a language capability. Um, within the operations group, we don't. Um, I'll be in Australia this summer, next summer we'll be in the Philippines. You know, I don't know where we're gonna be uh, the year after that. Two years ago, we were in Indonesia. So um, we're, we're more uh, focused on just delivering a quality training event and then there are capabilities in theater that can make up for the, uh, the language and, and cultural. Oh man. Zero AR up pretty soon. <laughs> On the line. Just turn that over. Hey sir, as the commander of a dynamic growing organization, oh, can you identify maybe where some of our gaps are that maybe some of our vendors could fill? Like if there's a need that we have that maybe someone could fill, is there anything that, uh, that you see that we need? Yeah, um, I mean, I, like it's the Rocky quote, like I got gaps, you got gaps, together we got no gaps. It's, uh, no, uh, um, you know, so, so for right now, uh, we, are, we are working our, our growth through um, uh, Army programs of record. Uh, to try to try to get after uh, building the CTC out, we're we're not the first CTC that America's ever built, that our Army's ever built, and so we're we've got three models to look at. Um, but then I also look at uh, the Australian CTC, completely different model from from ours on how we do business, right? Um, and so uh, the British CTC, they do things slightly different too. Um, so we don't necessarily. Uh, we're not trying to create NTC here. They have capabilities that um, are very uh, unique and are very well suited for a mechanized fight. Um, we are still working through uh, the kind of niche capabilities we'll need at, at JPMRC. And right now I'm just focused on making sure OCs are experts at um, observing, coach, teaching, mentoring uh, up in the Arctic, which is hard enough, uh, in the jungle, 
and in a maritime environment. So for those of you that uh, might have missed my panel presentation this morning, I said, uh, how many of you, I asked how many of you have seen Brad, the Brad Pitt movie Fight Club? And so, you know, the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club, right? But in Korea, we talk about being able to fight tonight and the readiness to fight tonight. And so I, I say, don't talk about fight tonight unless you're ready unless you're ready to win. And so it's important that our day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month preparations make sure that we're ready. And so why do we need to be ready? I recently, I used, it's the only chart that I normally ever use when I talk about. And it says Northeast Asia, and I just recently changed it uh, and included Taiwan, but I'm, Taiwan's not in Northeast Asia. But I just look at the overlapping competition in Northeast Asia, whether it's China, North Korea, or Russia. They're all named adversaries within our U.S. national defense strategy. Yet we've got great allies there. We've got the Republic of Korea, we've got Japan, and all kinds of other countries throughout Southeast Asia. But when you look at the world, and this portion of the world, there's a lot going on right now. And it only takes just a quick look at the news to understand the day-to-day -day competition which is going on. We saw yesterday Kim Jong-un took his daughter to work day. And it was, uh, I think, what they think will be a satellite launch. Well, I think we all know that the missile technology for launching a satellite into high Earth orbit is the same technology that it takes to put an intermediate range or inter not an intercontinental ballistic missile. His testing this year has been unprecedented. Although it's been quiet the last three weeks, it's without precedent. When we look at the actions of the Chinese Communist Party as well, as it relates to the region and the rest of the world, it's concerning. And of course, Russia's actions in Ukraine have put the world on edge as Ukraine fights for its freedom. So 73 years ago, the Republic of Korea was in a fight for its freedom when North Korea invaded unexpectedly. And the United States and 22 other countries, United Nations sending states came. And you look at it now, uh, people call it the miracle on the Han, Seoul. It's not a miracle. It's hard work not just from the Koreans, but also with help from others. And so I think when you see at what happened in Korea 73 years ago, the importance that this area is to the region, and then you think about what's happening in Ukraine, we want peace. We want peace throughout the region, and we want stability. And we do this through training and our operations with our allies and partners. Uh, the video that, that you just saw, for those of you that just saw it, with the exception of the black and white footage from uh, years ago, all the color footage was within the last year. That's real, live, combined training that's going on between the Republic of Korea and the United States forces. And it's inherently joint as well. You saw Army helicopters landing on Navy ships. You saw Korean uh, indirect fire as part of a U.S. Uh, combined arms live fire. You saw an American striker brigade offloading off of a ship. These are all things that are happening right now because if you look at, not just look at the region, but it goes back to, uh, we, had, we had the USS Ronald Reagan visit the port of Busan, I don't know, six, eight months ago. And the Ronald Reagan came in there and, and their motto as an aircraft carrier stems from one of Ronald Reagan's speeches that I think he gave in probably around May of 1981. Um, and he used the words peace through strength. And so the Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier sort of carries that as their motto. When you look at the Rock us Alliance and what we are doing within Northeast Asia, it is about maintaining the peace through strength, through our combined readiness. 
And as you look at the other allies and partners that are on there, specifically Japan, I think you've seen in the last few weeks uh, an increased desire both politically, diplomatically, and militarily for additional strength between the Republic of Korea, the United States, and Japan as we continue to build strength uh, in Northeast Asia. And so as I, as I wrap up here, I'm going to turn it over to Command Sergeant Major Cobb, who will talk a little bit more about his perspective and those things that are in uh, the Republic of Korea and our combined defense, and then we'll take questions. So over to Sergeant Major Cobb. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for taking your time to come listen to us for a little bit and learn a little bit more about the Korea Peninsula and what we have going on uh, in the Republic of Korea with our partners. So uh, you see the map behind us there has all of our, our adversaries that are working in the area every day, working in the gray area to build capacity, build their arsenals, and build their capabilities against us. But we know we work stronger and we're stronger together when we work with our partners. Uh, the way we do that in 8th Army is, you know, two ideas combined division. Um, the, the only really truly divine division, combined division in the Army. And our non-commissioned officer and junior leaders really build that capacity doing such things as rotations out at the Korean Combat Training Center. We started that off with just at the platoon level and we have continued to grow that um, out there at the training center to company and now battalion level task force that our ROC and uh, coalition part Army forces are working together at those training centers learning these service TTPs and how we conduct missions. We then expand that out to live fire exercises. You've seen some of that on the screen there. One of those that you saw was up at the JSA. That was a joint live fire between uh, Rock Infantry Platoon and our JSA elements up there. We just com completed a combined live fire exercise out at Rodriguez. That was K-1 tanks, Korean tanks. Their engineer forces out there hitting the breach with us and then our striker infantry going on and assaulting the objective. So that's kind of how we build the capacity with our coalition partners. We also do um, instructor exchanges. So we'll send American instructors over to their academies uh, to construct, instruct there, and then we'll also receive some of their instructors at our BLCs and then our Katusa training academies. All of our Katusas that are assigned down to the squad, platoon, and company level all across the 8th Army go through this training academy to kind of align them with some of the same training that American forces do before they reach their unit of assignment. So it's very helpful just to bind our cultures together, help us understand each other a little bit more, um, and make it, that bond even stronger um, with our ROC partners. We're continuing to expand this out um, with our ROC non-commissioned officers, and especially our Command Sergeant Majors and the ROC Army. Um, Command Sergeant Major Love at USFK gets us together around four times a year uh, to do events like Mungadai. Those are absolutely leadership challenges that are all master sergeants and command sergeant majors and we go out and we run through troop leading procedures together to show them how we execute those and then we come together during our Freedom Shield exercises to go out and actually visit those nodes that we'll be operating uh, and to do a neo evacuation exercise or to do combined operations. And we actually get on the ground that we would be fighting and operating <coughs> on and walk through those techniques and procedures so we make sure we have a clear understanding from both sides of how we would operate in those environments. So when we say that we're you know, training to fight the night, it's not just a bumper sticker. And we do everything we can to uh, continue to expand that capacity um, every day. We just recently started alerts that are assisted by um, our staff at the 8th Army level with our G3, G3 Sergeant Major, they go out and do a no-notice alert with a company. They pick a company within 8th Army, they alert that company, and then they basically go out and give them a grade on their report card, on their alert procedures, assembly, draw, dispatch, and prepare to move to make sure we can laser focus on those elements that we need to make sure we can alert quickly and then move out to our assembly areas to get ready to assist in the mission that we, we may be doing. So uh, we're very proud of the efforts that we're doing, but we're not going to be uh, sit back on our laurels and think we're where we need to be at. We have to constantly continue to improve every day, and myself and General Burleson are very proud of the steps that 8th Army and 2ID have taken in the last few years, and they're continuing to build upon that capacity. So thank you for uh, your time, and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Um, I mean, I... I honestly think as we look at how we develop new capabilities, whether it's direct, indirect fires, directed energy, whether it's cyber, EW, 
any of the other multiple domain things. We got to look at it from a doctor, organization, training, leader development, material, personnel. So great opportunities here for, you know, to look at technological advances. But if we don't have the other pieces that go with it, you know, it's just like I'm giving you a new hammer, right? You're going to use it the same way. Some things, um, when you look at high energy lasers, uh, and I think about like a capability like that, what I'm thinking as an infantryman is, what's the range fan, right? What's the range fan? How do I protect myself? How do I protect others? And how do I eliminate the threat uh, that I'm trying to neutralize? And so I think we can answer those questions pretty quickly. That's science, right? But then what does it mean for how we fight? How does it fundamentally change how we fight or employ fires? I think we got to look at it in total. Good capabilities, we just got to understand what it means total for us and everything. No, so what, what's interesting, you know, we went to uh, IPAMS here last year, right? And we had uh, forces from all across the Pacific come together. And all the start majors got together. And we thought we were going to be very unique in our problem sets that we had. Well, believe it or not, we have the exact same problem sets across all the armies, right? And when it comes to non-commissioned officers, it's you know, making sure we get the right training resources for one. Two, they're trained. Three, um, instilling standards and discipline within our young soldiers, right? Because when I was growing up, I didn't ask why. I just, okay, you want me to dig the foxhole? I'm going to dig it. How deep you want it? How wide do you want it? I got it. And now it's, hey, we need to go dig some foxholes, fill some sandbags. This is how deep and wide, but why? Why does it have to be this deep? Why does it have to be this wide? So it's bridging that communication. I'm not going to say gap. It's that communication difference now between the generations. How do we communicate with the younger generations and be effective in doing it? It's those still same problems, right? Even in the Rock Army. And, you know, we look at our, um, you know, we'd say the Rock Army is a conscript army and they only have them for about two years. Well, if you look at us in the American Army in Korea, we really only have them for about a year because they're for a one year rotation, right? So how do we optimize that training cycle to get the most training and the most value added training in that period of time to make them as competent as we can be? So we just have to have a very focused, um, laser focused training plans um, and make sure we're giving our non-commissioned officers the time to execute those training plans. But believe it or not, you know, language difference, cultural difference, you put two NCOs together, uh, very, very similar problems and very uh, similar successes. They're great non-commissioned officers. They just have to have the tools they need to execute the training we're asking them to do, right? So very good non-commissioned officer on the rock side. Uh, so General Eifer's question, how do we maintain our interoperability between uh, the U.S. and the Republic of Korea? So I, I look at interoperability, really three things, human, procedural, and technical. They will continue, we'll continue to chase uh, the Chihuahua around of technical interoperability, right? As we try and get our networks to talk. We do have Centrix K, which is our combined network. Uh, tactical voice bridging allows us to potentially be able to speak to each other. But remember, we gotta understand each other, right? I mean, I've seen it where Americans and British can't understand each other. And we speak a common language, supposedly, right? So I'm always a little bit suspect of when I just hear the technical solutions. I'm actually a much strong believer in human procedural. And what I believe we're able to do better than anybody else is we have developed over 50, 70 years, a series of crisis action standard operating procedures. So if one of them is how to tie your shoe, right? There's a quick reference sheet. That's one sheet that says how to tie your shoe. Behind that, there's a phone book of all the things you got to do. Now, we don't have one for tying our shoes, but whether it's calling for fire, uh, elevating what, our security threats. So the work has been done ahead of time procedurally. It's been agreed upon. We've translated it, retranslated it, translated it back to eliminate ambiguity. So all we got to say is execute this crisis action SOP at this time. Everybody pulls it out. There's no ambiguity. Human interoperability, um, well, I think there's, there's a lot of things that are important on this. Is First of all, we're fortunate that we have the Korean augmentation of the United States Army program. And, you know, as the Korean Army changes its size and structure, so do our Katusas. But they're embedded within our formation. Some of these are kids working on college degrees at Oxford. 
I mean, their, their English is better than mine. And they provide that language interoperability. I think we're also fortunate that the Republic of Korea has one of the highest, per, maybe perhaps the highest per capita number of young adults that go to the United States for education. So English as a language in Korea has become much more prolific. So the average Korean can, can speak some Korean. Uh, but more importantly, to underscore it all, is our day-to-day -day combined training. I mean, this can't be one of these things where you show up for a training exercise and go, let's figure out how to be interoperable. I mean, 2ID is doing bridge crossings. That's one of the most complex operations that we have, doing a bridge crossing in a combined unit. Uh, we have the Korean Combat Training Center, which is a Korean Combat Training Center, much like our Joint Readiness Training Center, National Training Center, the one we got in Hohenfels. Now that we have a striker brigade, we've embedded a striker battalion with a Korean regiment in KCTC. So you got a battalion, U.S. battalion commander, a thinking staff that now is part of that Korean staff that just, it improves our interoperability every single day. So I, I'd say it's, it's not episodic, it's day to day and it's continuous. It's like being a lineman on a football team, contact all the time. And that's what builds our interoperability. And sir, if I could add to that, you know, we got to keep talent on the team, right? You hear General Flynn talking about bringing folks back to the Pacific, right? Um, you know, I go out to Sergeant Majors Academy. We go out to Leavenworth every year, and we talk to our folks coming in, and we hope that they come accompanied, right? Because, you know, it's a little selfish, right, because we want to keep it for two years. But every single time the families get over there, they love it, and they don't want to leave. And we have to tell that story so we continue to get our talent back to Korea. Uh, Korea is not the Korea of old. You're not hurting for anything. Camp Humphreys is one of the newest installations in the United States Army, right? Everything's new. Um, the subway systems, you hop on the subway or the train system, and you're up in Seoul in two hours. You go have a nice day, come on back down to Humphreys. So the country is a very developed country. We're not hurting for anything. Families absolutely love it. Uh, and when they get over there, um, you'll find most of the time they won't, won't leave. But we get that talent on the team, and then we keep getting the repeat offenders, right? They get back and they hadn't forgot all that knowledge they had the last time they were there. They're just bringing it back to the team, they're re-bluing it and see how they can plug right back into the team and keep fighting again. It's my third time there, right? And every single time I've come back, I've seen how much progress we've made, how much we've improved our combined fighting force together. Uh, and it's, it, it's pretty impressive. Um, so we invite everybody that's out there on the ask cycle to put your name in the hat and come on to Korea and join uh, a winning team where you're actually going to do your job. Our intel folks, our, uh, you know, our air traffic controllers, you know, all those folks, they're doing their real job every single day. They got a real target, a real enemy. They're not fighting the Atropians down in JRTC, right? So come do your real job and join the team over in Korea and uh, learn how to fight at night, right? Thank you for coming to AUSA and coming here for our little commander's corner. Uh, and I wish you a great lunch. Thank you very much. I'm Brian Martin. I'm the uh, commander of the uh, 196 Infantry, which forms the ops group for the Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center, JPMRC. And uh, thanks for being here this afternoon to hear about the center and the great work uh, that the team from uh, JPMRC does to put on training events. So. Uh, the Army's got three CTCs that they've had for the last 40-ish years or so, and uh, we are just now kind of putting the final touches on the fourth uh, combat training center uh, that the Army's built. And we've built it out here in the Indo-Pacific, and we do three rotations a year. We do one here in Alaska, or one in Alaska, one here in Hawaii, and one west of the International Dateline. And the whole goal is to uh, keep forces in theater. So for a data point, uh, we save about 110 days of readiness where we're not sending forces back to the continental United States. Um, we're able to save about $80 million per rotation by keeping them out here and not having to ship everything back to, uh, to CONUS. But more importantly, we're able to work with our allies and partners here in theater uh, in the environment in which the USARPAC forces will, uh, will go ahead and, and deter and, if necessary, fight. And so we do that with uh, 
with a fairly small footprint right now. And when we're fully built out, we'll be about 441 folks. We're, we're nowhere even close to that right now. We still rely on a lot of support from First Corps and from uh, other elements back in CONUS to execute, execute each one of these rotations. Um, but, uh, but it's good work. And some of the team you see around here are, are the folks who carry the really, really heavy load of uh, making these rotations happen. So they're doing what a, what a team of about 800 folks do. Uh, they're doing it with about 100 folks uh, to make each one of these occur. And, we are very log heavy since we uh, ship this system all over the Indo-Pacific. And so um, when we build readiness for forces here in theater, we're able to display a combat credible force in the environment in which they're going to fight. So the 25th Infantry Division, uh, my main job is to help that division commander train his brigade uh, in, in jungle warfare, and in an island fight, which is something our military has is, is not really done uh, since the 40s. Uh, when we go to Alaska, I work with the 11th Airborne, and we train that brigade in how to fight in the Arctic, how to fight in extreme cold weather, and how to fight in the mountains. So when you kind of think you know, we never want to have a repeat of the Chosen Reservoir, the 11th Airborne is, is at the forefront in figuring out how to keep that from happening, right? How to actually thrive and, and survive, not just survive, but thrive and fight in the Arctic environment. And then when we go west of the International Dateline, those rotations are really focused on displaying a combat credible force alongside our ally and partner and showing the application of that readiness uh, forward. Uh, to date, we've had 16 observer nations come and uh, embed in the exercises. And we, are, we just finished our, our fifth exercise. So that's 16 different nations, with five exercises coming out and seeing kind of behind the curtain how we put on the exercise, the training value uh, to forces that would fight here in the Indo-Pacific. Eight of those nations have joined us uh, as either part of the rotational unit, uh, part of the OP4, or part of the exercise control. Um, and specifically, we have very, very close relationships with the Australian CTC, the Indonesian CTC, where we executed a rotation uh, two years ago. Um, next year, we'll be in the Philippines, so we're working with the Armed Forces of the Philippines CTC, and uh, for, for all things Arctic, we have a very, very close relationship with the Canadian CTC. When you hear about JPMRC rotations, anything with a Dash 01 is a Hawaii-based rotation working on the, the inter-island fight. And uh, anything with a Dash 02 is the Alaska rotation, the Alaska fight. We also have uh, very close relationships and growing relationships with the CTC in Japan the CTC in Korea, and um, uh, uh, the CTC in Singapore. That's just kind of beginning to, to, to uh, develop. Importantly, you know, these are all rehearsals uh, for, for, you know, deterring conflict and uh, for the readiness that's built here in Hawaii, the readiness that's built in Alaska, when they deploy that forward west of the international dateline, um, if something were to develop and there's a crisis underway, they've rehearsed how they would respond to that through JPMRC. So um, it is the 25th Infantry Division commander and 11th Airborne commander's way to validate their forces before they deploy forward. Let's go ahead, next slide. So as I said before, uh, up in Alaska, uh, we're figuring out how to fight in the Arctic, right? How uh, we've got an Arctic strategy we don't really have any documentation on how to actually fight in the Arctic. And uh, the 11th Airborne's working on that. Their commander uses JPMRC as a way to do that at scale with uh, anywhere uh, between 5,000 to 8,000 people in the field. We had about 8,000 people this last rotation. Here in H Hawaii, we are living chapter seven of FN 3-0, which is the uh, Army Operations in a Maritime Environment. So if you were to take that doctrine and you were to overlay it on our, our rotations, you can see it play out, right? And, and again, we are experimenting with uh, what does it take to sustain a force on an inter-island fight? Uh, how do army forces in a maritime environment um, exercise sea control, ex execute uh, maritime domain awareness, and execute targets at sea? And we're working all of that out right now. Uh, uh, Last rotation, we had a sensor to shooter exercise uh, in our, our live virtual and constructive wrap. 
where we had a joint element, the 3rd Marine Littoral Regiment, which is executing their um, expeditionary advanced basing operations, uh, sent a, uh, a enemy DDG, passed that targeting off, data off to 25th Infantry Division, who passed it to 15th Wing, who then passed it to a Naval Strike Group 3 DDG at sea that executed the target. Um, and these are all kind of emerging concepts on, on how we're going to do joint all domain operations. We're exercising that here now in the Indo-Pacific with uh, our joint partners that we're surrounded by, right? So we don't have to go and ask uh, other joint partners to play. They, they're showing up. They want to be part of this. Um, for Army forces, especially Army forces early in crisis, it's only going to be joint partners around us, right? Until tip fit and forces flow into, into, uh, into theater. They're going to have, you know, a brigade that's forward is going to have to figure out how do they play with 15th wing, how do they interoperate with PAC fleet, and how do they work with uh, the Marines that are part of the stand-in force. Um, to kind of round all of this out, we're currently executing uh, high-range operations where you put long-range precision fires on uh, Air Force aircraft, move them in from an off-axis uh, to allow them to uh, execute long-range uh, targets both in support of the, um, of the JFAC uh, and in support of, of Army uh, operations. We've uh, executed uh, GPS denial, RF jamming, um, a whole suite of small UASs, uh, kind of stuff you see in, uh, in the media from Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and importantly, we're teaching forces here how to use uh, extended sensing overhead SAR, overhead uh, EOIR as part of their operations process. And this works both ways. Uh, because we are replicating a near-peer adversary, the OP4 gets that as well. Um, so that, that's something new our forces uh, have to contend with, uh, especially guys in my generation where we didn't really have to worry about the adversary having uh, SAR overhead of, of what our footprint might look like at any given point on the battlefield. We work closely uh, with 3rd MDTF as they're beginning to build their forces. They're embedded uh, in, uh, in our exercises. And uh, as you can see up here, uh, this is an upcoming exercise uh, that we'll execute in the Hawaiian Islands, out in Guam, Midway, Johnson Atoll, Wake Island uh, this upcoming fall. 3rd uh, MDTF will move out with a package from 25th ID uh, to execute some of their uh, extended range sensing some of their electronic attack, electronic warfare capability, and long-range precision fires out of Guam. At the same time, uh, marine elements led by the Marine Air Group out of Kanahoe Bay will um, move to uh, uh, Midway and execute some of their uh, uh, EABO. And 15th Wing will ex execute uh, their uh, uh, agile combat employment uh, out of Wake Island as a C2 element for kind of a replicated uh, reinforcement of a first island chain, if you will. While that's occurring back on the Hawaiian uh, main archipelago, uh, we're going to be conducting uh, decisive uh, land operations in a maritime environment as a 25th ID uh, secures uh, islands uh, that, are, that are replicating a, a, a U.S. Uh, treaty ally that's uh, asked for help in restoring their national sovereignty. And we're really gonna experiment with, with how do we do sustainment of a fight uh, between islands and how do we move army forces on an inner island fight. Um, we're, not, we're not allowing them to prepo anything on the big island. They're gonna have to figure out how they're gonna get from uh, the northern part of Oahu all the way to the big island and, and kind of culminate there. I don't wanna give too much of it away uh, from a scenario development perspective. Um, so we're still growing the CTC. It is, um, it's up and running. It's been up since uh, 2022. As we said, we just executed our fifth uh, rotation. We'll execute a rotation in Australia uh, this upcoming uh, summer. Um, and uh, as we build this thing out, there's kind of five pillars that we're, we're building the training center out around. The first one, the operational environment uh, in the op, Op 4, the operational environment kind of sets itself. It's the Indo-PACOM uh, operational environment. Um, from an Op 4 perspective, we use the decisive uh, action, action uh, training environment, uh, Pacific, which is built around the Alvanian threat. That's 
the name of the, you know, for those of us who are Krasinovians back in the day, uh, Olvana is a threat that um, has us uh, with, a, with a larger population. Um, they have us with um, longer range fires, more fires than we're used to, and they have us with tech that's as good, if not better than ours. Um, and we are all Olvana all the time. That's the only thing we focus on here on like some legacy CTCs that have to kind of mix in other threat templates. Um, and uh, under this model, uh, we don't have a permanent OP4. We have a kind of a permanent cadre of OP4 um, teachers that embed with a, uh, a unit uh, starting about three or four months out before the rotation and using ATP 7-100.3, which is the unclassified version of of uh, the PLA threat tactics, uh, we go ahead and, and turn them into an opposing force. Uh, so this kind of creates a, uh, a, an understanding of the significant uh, adversary challenge in this area in, in the operating force. Um, and as everyone knows, when, when you get to play Op 4, uh, they play it with a degree of uh, gusto that uh, when you put a, a helmet on somebody in Miles gear and their morale just kind of plummets, they just don't have, you put a boonie cap and Miles gear on somebody and they really kind of get after it. And we've had very, very professional Op 4 out here uh, create dilemmas for, uh, for our training forces, for the rotational units. For the operations group, again, it's centered around the 196th Infantry Brigade. Um, when we're fully manned, which will be about 441 folks, uh, we're still only gonna be half to one third the size of the other CTCs. And, and this is because we only execute three rotations a year. Um, and we don't need 800, 1200 people to execute back to back to back to back rotations. Um, so importantly, we are uh, very integrated with our multinational uh, partners. As I said before, we've had, um, uh, the Australians have been inside our XCON, they've been op four for us. Uh, we've had Canadians that have been part of our OCT packages, uh, Indonesians who have been OCTs uh, with us, and, uh, and this summer we'll be, we'll be fully integrated with Australian uh, CTC. And then more importantly, we're, uh, we're truly a joint operations group. So we've got Marine OCs that show up for these exercises. Uh, we've got the Air Force that's using something similar to an OC capability uh, for their exercise. And more importantly, the kind of the most important thing, um, you could do away with the rest of this stuff, and as long as you have a good OC, who can sit down and observe, coach, teach, and mentor uh, a, a, a peer uh, as they work through a difficult problem set, uh, we're still gonna get a lot of good training, a lot, a lot of good uh, learning out of that training repetition. And uh, I would submit with what uh, the OCC out here in the Indo-Pacific, uh, with the problems folks have to work through out here, they're, they're not problems that we've had to grapple with over the last 20 years. Um, you know, how do you sustain, how do you move through mountainous jungle, right, and still just keep track of your frontline trace? Uh, how do you survive in the Arctic? Um, these are all things that ROCs are kind of experts on and really help their, uh, their partnered force, if you will, the force that they're OCing, make it through a rotation. And then most importantly, uh, the after action review where the real learning occurs. Uh, my folks that are out here in white, they're, they're experts at doing it. Um, and uh, we deliver a really, really good product for the training brigades. For the rotational training units, uh, again, the brigade is kind of the center. It's the focus point for us, right? They're the ones that have to get out of here, uh, leave our training events with a heightened state of readiness. But uh, most importantly, uh, starting with our very first rotation, we use the division as the uh, higher command. Um, and so there's no 21st infantry or 52nd infantry where it's a guy like me who's dual hatting as, a, as the, uh, the ops group commander who's dialing the reostat of training uh, and as the commander, you know, the higher commander of the rotational unit. Uh, here it is the 25th infantry division commander. It's the 11th airborne uh, commander who is executing those mission command functions um, for the training unit. And it, it's incredibly powerful to watch the division commander and the division staff work with the RTU commander, the brigade commander going through training, and the brigade staff, and then the battalions and all the uh, downtrace units that are going through the training 
and they're working through complex military problems. And they're doing it in, you know, in the uh, crucible that's a CTC rotation. It's an incredibly powerful thing to watch. And uh, my peers the, who are going through the training have all come out of it and said, you know, that is, that, that's how you form tight teams. You, you, know, you make people do hard things um, and uh, give them an opportunity to learn. And it's been an incredibly successful uh, training opportunity from, from that perspective. So Division HICON, the brigade going through the training, and then we leverage the full suite of the uh, echelons above brigade that come out of first corps to execute these. So engineers, MP support, uh, medical support, third MDTF, and then General Flynn has kind of given direction to all of his um, major commands and all of his direct report uh, units that they'll support this, right? So we've got uh, support from 8th uh, uh, TSC, from um, uh, Compo 2 and Compo 3 units coming out of 9th MSC, the Hawaii National Guard, the Guam National Guard that all support these uh, rotations. Uh, huge support from 5th SVAB because of our multinational flavor uh, that come out to, uh, to enable this training and medical support from 18th MedCom. And so he's able to exercise various elements of the theater army when these uh, rotations uh, go ahead and, and get executed. Everybody comes to the table with their own training objectives. Again, we put the primacy of the training objective on the brigade that's going through the training, uh, but everyone's able to walk away. And I check them every single day while we're going through rotation. How many training objectives are being achieved? What still has to be, you know, be hit uh, before the end of the rotation? And uh, we're, we're batting like 99% on, uh, on training objectives being met by you know, all echelons of units that show up for these. As I said earlier, we are surrounded by joint assets here in Hawaii, here in Indo-PACOM, uh, the US Indo-PACOM AOR. Uh, they show up with their own training objectives. And, and here's where the beauty of JPMRC really gets, gets to unfold. We're not paying $6 million to get the Air Force to show up to Fort Johnson in Louisiana to execute uh, training alongside an Army element at JRTC. They show up with their own training objectives here because we're in the environment they need to train in, we're the partner they need to train in, um, and we're executing the sort of operations they need help um, or that, that they have synergy with when we train together. And so they show up and they're paying their own flight hours, which if, if you've ever worked with the Air Force, right, flight hours are massively expensive. Um, they're accomplishing their own training objectives. The Navy's accomplishing their own training objectives as part of this, um, but it's, it's not coming on the, you know, the Army's dime, if you will, from a, from a training perspective. It's, it's huge. Um, and at the at kind of a tactical level, of the, a lot of the joint interoperability that we de developed over the last 20 years of working together in, in various AORs, um, that's being sustained uh, by the touches that the brigade's getting with uh, the different air wings that show up, with the different naval strike groups that participate in this, and, and especially with our Marine Corps uh, elements here on island. And kind of the outer layer of all that is the allies and partners and our friends in the theater that show up for, uh, for training, again, with their own training events, training objectives that they need to hit, um, but they, uh, they all walk out of this uh, with, uh, with a higher proficiency from when they went in. And uh, we all get to learn from each other on, on how we operate um, and developing relationships you know, that are gonna last uh, careers as these things progress. From an instrumentation perspective, if you're familiar with the CTC, so we do the live virtual constructive, uh, we're able to replicate things that really aren't there because they're appearing on mission command systems uh, they're being injected through um, our instrumentation. And then the same instrumentation takes feedback so that we're able to provide good after action reviews on here's what really happened. Um, I'm able to take this anywhere in theater. We pack it up, it's about 26 Sealand containers and we can move it. Uh, it's currently being moved from Alaska to Australia. Um, we are not fixed to a particular piece of terrain which gives, from a training perspective, gives you tons of options, right? And again, at guys at my level who've been at JRTC 15 times, like, they know the terrain, they know the fight, they know where the, the decisive terrain, you know, that they have to hold here is. Here we can switch it up on folks. And then uh, last, as I said, facilities, we're completely exportable. Uh, it's the beauty of the system. It's, uh, it's the beauty of the way this thing's been set up. It's, um, 
you know, USARPAC works out an agreement with a multinational partner and, and they want us in a country in a year from now, we start the planning 270 days out, we pack this thing up, we move it, and we go ahead and execute training. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Fifth SBAB said they were gonna have some hard ones. Thanks. Very helpful and insightful. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the work that you're able to do with the, the multinational training that, that we get at. Are there limitations for how many partners that, that we can bring into these different exercises? Yeah. So the question uh, was, are there limitations to um, how many multinational partners we can bring into the training? So there's, there's two limiting factors on that. The first one is terrain. Um, so in Alaska, uh, the sky's your limit. The training area is up there, the size of the state of Indiana. Um, so there's, there's a lot that you can do in Alaska. Um, on an island, there's limited training opportunities. And so um, um, right now, it's, it's about one partner for uh, each American maneuver element. So three like light infantry company size elements. Um, but there's room for everything that's not maneuver, right? So the other war fighting functions, um, the New Zealand contingent is bringing, um, they're bringing a field artillery element uh, up this year. So we're, we're at about capacity right now this year with about six partners that are gonna show up for this next training event um, here in the fall. Um, and it's about uh, we're at about 830 multinational uh, soldiers that'll show up. That's, a, that's kind of about right for the Hawaiian Island uh, training scenario. Sir. Do you have a, um, a language or a cultural training component to this? So the question is if we have a language or cultural training component to this. Um, when I mentioned earlier that we, uh, we rely on uh, other uh, USERPAC elements to help us with, put on these training events, um, one of the key partners for our, our multinational allies and partners, friends who show up, is the, is the fifth SFAB. And they kind of have that cultural uh, experience to a degree they, they may have a language capability. Um, within the operations group, we don't. Um, I'll be in Australia this summer. Next summer, we'll be in the Philippines. You know, I don't know where we're going to be uh, the year after that. Two years ago, we were in Indonesia. So um, we're, we're more uh, focused on just delivering a quality training event. And then there are capabilities in theater that can make up for the, uh, the language and, and cultural Zero AR up pretty soon. <laughs> On the line. Just turn that over. Hey, sir, as the commander of a dynamic, growing organization, oh, can you identify maybe where some of our gaps are that maybe some of our vendors could fill? Like if there's a need that we have that maybe someone could fill, is there anything that, uh, that you see that we need? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, like, it's the Rocky quote, like, I got gaps, you got gaps. Together we got no gaps. It's... Uh, no, uh, um, you know, so, so for right now, uh, we, are, we are working our, our growth through um, uh, Army programs of record uh, to try to, try to get after uh, building the CTC out. We're, we're not the first CTC that America's ever built, that our Army's ever built. And so we're, we've got three models to look at, um, but then I also look at uh, the Australian CTC, completely different model from from ours on how we do business, right? Um, and so uh, the British CTC, they do things slightly different too. Um, so we don't necessarily, uh, we're not trying to create NTC here. They have capabilities that um, are very uh, unique and are very well suited for a mechanized fight. Um, we are still working through uh, the kind of niche capabilities we'll need at, at JPMRC. Right now, I'm just focused on making sure OCs 
are experts at um, observing, coach, teaching, mentoring uh, up in the Arctic, which is hard enough, uh, in the jungle, and in a maritime environment. That's with Army Futures Command, with ASALT, it's with our industry partners, and it's really with the greater Army team. That is one thing that I have realized just each and every day, is that this would never happen if we were not operating as one team together. Really the purpose of what I'd like to go over today uh, is twofold. Uh, first, I'd really like to give you an overview of the MDTF and how it serves as a joint force enabler. Why we were specifically designed to enable the joint force. Uh, the second thing I'd like to go over is really talk about how the MDTF operates. You know, really how we improve joint readiness, how we advance interoperability, and also how we help create uh, interior lines, which I think is so important, particularly as you listen to General Flynn and the other guest speakers today, about the importance of land power in the Indo-Pacific. So if we go next slide, please. So the first slide here really shows kind of our problem set and our task organization and how we operate. The multi-domain task force was developed really to, to begin to tackle the challenge and the dilemma that the A2AD network, the anti-access area denial network in the region posed to the US, the joint, the coalition uh, forces uh, in the region. Back in about the 2015, 2016 timeframe, then Chief of Staff of the Army, General Milley, realized that we have a lot of really exquisite capabilities that we're developing non-kinetically, as well as exquisite capabilities that we're in development for kinetic operations. But when you look at the A280 network and you look at the joint force in theater back at that time, they were generally, you know, fundamentally out of position in order to apply those capabilities to counter the dilemma of the anti-access area denial uh, network. At that time, Admiral uh, Harry Harris, who was uh, commanding uh, Indo-PACOM, PACOM at the time, looked at the, uh, the Army and said, I really need you to be able to do four things to enable Indo-PACOM. I need you to be able to sink ships. I need you to be able to shoot down aircraft and missiles. I need you to be able to neutralize satellites, and I need you to be able to hack and jam the adversary C2. Those four things I really need you to be able to do to make sure that Indo-PACOM is successful, particularly looking at the A2AD problem set. So what's really important is as General Milley and then followed on by General McConville started looking at this problem set, he realized if we were able to take our emerging non-kinetic capabilities and our emerging kinetic capabilities and be able to synchronize those under one headquarters, we could then enable the joint force. And this is why it's really important to understand the MDTF as a joint force enabler. Although on our uniforms, we will wear US Army, we do not exist specifically to support an Army unit. We exist to support that joint force commander as he or she looks at that problem set to neutralize portions of the A280 network to enable that joint freedom of, of action. So again, we are specifically tied to that joint task force commander to help neutralize portions of that A280 network to enable that joint task force freedom of maneuver within portions of that A2AD uh, umbrella. So very, very important for us to, to see how we, uh, how we operate as part of that joint task force. The next thing that we notice is that if we were able to put our non-kinetic and kinetic capabilities under one task force, well then that joint task force commander would be able to go to one formation in order to synchronize what previously were disparate uh, capabilities with non-kinetics and kinetics. The next thing that we recognized was when the adversary built the A280 network, that A280 network was really designed based off of lessons that were learned back in the Desert Storm, Desert Shield days of when you thought of the shock and awe campaign. You know, the ability for the US and a coalition to present mass at a target uh, in order to achieve an effect. 
So when that A2AD network was designed, it was designed specifically against high-flying aircraft as well as capital craft that would be operating in the area. So as we looked at a task force design, what a task force allowed us to do were to establish multi-domain cells that you can see up there into smaller, tailorable, maneuverable, survivable elements that could operate forward that weren't the same signature as a high-flying aircraft or a capital craft that a lot of the A2AD network was designed uh, to combat. The next thing we realized was our ability to understand elements of the A2AD network. And as we looked at, uh, for example, this DD that's uh, in the middle of the slide, we looked at what were the vulnerabilities of these potential um, assets. And what you see uh, highlighted there is that each of these assets have multiple what we would call access vectors. How do they operate as part of the A280 network? And as you can see, there are, there are several capabilities, whether it be line of sight radio, navigation, radar in order to protect their own assets or to utilize as part of their weapon solutions, and then weapon systems themselves that utilize the electromagnetic spectrum. So as the multi-domain task force was formed, I'll draw your attention to the top right. And it was very specifically designed to synchronize non-kinetic effects with kinetic effects in order to achieve that neutralization of elements of the A280 network. So on that top line, you'll see non-kinetic effects. Three examples of those effects are first, a space company. So think of small space teams you heard uh, General Dickinson talk about it earlier, with the ability to be in the environment, sense the environment, understand how certain assets of the A2AD network utilize the space environment, and then be able to provide an effect against uh, that system. The second box you'll see up there is our extended range um, sensing and effects company. So think about, as we start operating at longer ranges, our ability to do deep sensing to sense and make sense of the environment, and then be able to tie that with electromagnetic sensing, and again, be able to make sense of that environment, and also be able to deliver effects to potentially neutralize elements uh, within the electromagnetic spectrum to help isolate. And then the third you'll see up there is cyber, primarily a defensive cyber capability to protect our networks, to protect coalition networks, but then also the ability to plan and synchronize with our cyber cyber command in order to look at offensive cyber operations, again, to help neutralize and isolate elements of the A280 network that operates as part of the Internet of Things. So if you look on the bottom right, and I'll just uh, step away from the mic for a second, you will see this area right here. And what we call that is our electromagnetic isolation. So if we look at our plane, our space, our cyber, our EW, and our information operations, we are looking to electromagnetically isolate a portion of that A280 network. That in and of itself could potentially neutralize that target from being able to provide the effect that it does within that A280 network. If that in and of itself does not provide that neutralization effect, what it does do is set the conditions for what you see on the bottom right of kinetic strike options to improve its capability to be successful against a particular target. So if you look at the top right again, you'll see that row that says kinetic effects. So the MDTF was fielded with three kinetic batteries. The first is our traditional high Mars battery. Uh, that most are tracking, of course, particularly from uh, the success of HIMARS in Ukraine. So we have a battery of nine total HIMARS with the capability to shoot uh, traditional HIMARS munitions, but also with the future fielding of the precision strike munition, or PRISM, that is, uh, that is going to be fielded beginning this year. The second battery is our mid-range capability battery. So think of our, our mid-range uh, being standard missile six, Tomahawk capabilities. So if, if HIMARS can get you out to the multiple hundreds of kilometers, mid-range capability with those two type weapon systems, 
now gets you well past that 1,000 uh, kilometer range um, into the battle space. The third battery that was formed was the long range hypersonics battery. So that battery is currently fielded and currently going through the testing that many are tracking with the uh, rapid capabilities and critical technologies offices. They go through the, the missile testing uh, and being able to deliver that long range hypersonics weapon well outside of that 2,000 kilometer range. So if you look at the, the problem set of the A280 network, we're able to synchronize the timing and tempo of those non-kinetic options to be able to electromagnetically isolate a potential threat. And if that doesn't achieve neutralization, that increases the probability that a high Mars, mid-range capability, long-range hypersonics has the ability to kinetically strike that target. Now, as we synchronize that long-range uh, fires as well as those uh, long-range precision effects, we also have two additional battalions, our Protection Battalion and Sustainment Battalion. Protection Battalion is our Air Defense Artillery uh, Battalion. Uh, that will be the indirect fire protection capability that we are currently uh, geared towards right now. So currently fielded bridging solution to get us there, but that will allow us the ability to protect multiple cells that are operating forward uh, in the region. And then our sustainment capability. You know, multiple small groups today and uh, keynote speakers talking about the challenges of sustainment within the theater. So oftentimes we become, you know, very, um, our partnership is very important with APSC as we operate within theater. Our ability to operate side by side with our host nation partners and then our ability to have interior lines in order to minimize our uh, supply lines to those small multi-domain cells that are operating. So if we take those multiple elements, again, those cumulative effects are to electromagnetically isolate with the potential to kinetically strike a target. Uh, General Flynn oftentimes talks about the adversary has three advantages you know, over our force as we operate in the region. You know, the first is mass, and it's very hard to match you know, the adversary's mass, mass in the region. The second is magazine depth. When you look at the magazine depth of an adversary and you look at our magazine depth, you know, there is a significant mismatch there. That is where our ability to leverage non-kinetic effects and sync the timing and tempo to either have those non-kinetic effects achieve neutralization or improve the probability of hit of our kinetic effects helps to bridge that gap uh, between the mismatch and magazine depth. And then the third is interior lines. Our ability to establish within the first island chain helps develop those interior lines that are so critical to competing and preventing war uh, in the region. So if you look on the bottom, you'll see that you know, right now, MDTFs between uh, first and third MDTF are deployed you know, across more than 6,000 miles in 10 time zones, really building those interior lines with combat credible forces that are forward. And if you go next slide, please. So this is a graphical representation of where the MDTFs sit today or where they will be during Pathways 23 in order to achieve those interior lines. So what you'll see from starting from the left to the west is Tiger Bomb. Last year we executed Tiger Bomb with, uh, with Singapore in Singapore. This year it's happening right here in Hawaii as we build that interoperability with our partners. We also have in the center there the Philippines. You've heard a lot of talk about Balakatan and Salakaneeb. So First MDTF has been a part of Salakaneeb uh, since it was TAC-1 at the beginning of March and have had a continuous presence with our Philippine and our joint partners uh, throughout Salakaneeb TAC-1, Balakatan, Balakatan, and now Salakaneeb uh, TAC-2, and we'll talk a little bit about that here coming up. Uh, currently, we also have, if you look to the top right in Alaska, I mentioned 3rd MDTF. They're currently conducting you know, their first large-scale exercise tied as part of an indo pacom constructed uh, exercise, Northern Edge 23 TAC-1, to test their non-kinetic and their kinetic capabilities um, as part of that task force. Uh, coming up later in the year on the on further south, 
uh, Talisman Sabre, third MDTF, will also lead efforts as they continue to increase their partnership and their relationship with our Australian partners. And then to the north in Japan, you'll see in the fall series of uh, operations uh, that we will be partnered you know, with both the Western Army and the Northern Army as we execute Orient Shield, Resolute Dragon alongside our Marine partners, as well as Yamasakura. And when we execute Resolute Dragon, again, an FTX style operation where we'll be pushing you know, live assets forward in order to test them in a live environment, in you know, real conditions uh, against live assets as well. And then finally, I'll circle back around to the Philippines, which I think is so important, is as we have continued to build uh, these relationships, not only with the joint force, but with our partners, is again deploying live capabilities with our HIMARS, live capabilities with collection assets to include experimental UAS assets, and then live assets with collection platforms uh, that we are using in the live environment. Uh, and it'll come up later as a lesson learned, but one of the most significant lessons, particularly for our industry partners here, is the importance of testing these live systems in the live environment, where we would expect them to compete if we transition from competition to crisis to conflict, to understand exactly how that piece of equipment is going to operate in the demands of the environment that will be presented. And in the center, you'll see just in uh, Balakatan alone, we did over 50 constructive engagements with our Philippine partners, with the U.S. Navy, with the U.S. Marine Corps, um, and the U.S. Air Force. And really, the first ever time that we were able to do a complete constructive engagement from sensing the environment, building a collection plan, building a targeting plan, all the way through uh, constructive delivery of, uh, of effects, both non-kinetic and kinetic, alongside our Filipino partners. Next slide, please. So really what's part of interior lines, and again, I'll highlight the Philippines. You heard General Flynn uh, several times discuss today about the combined information and effects fusion cell, or the SIFC, uh, that we stood up alongside um, our Filipino partners, as well as alongside our Marine Corps 3rd MEF, or 3rd MAR DIB, uh, who was conducting JTF activities. And what we recognized was as we were conducting this joint operation, we needed connective tissue both between the joint force, elements of our U.S. joint force, as well as elements of the Filipino joint force and the U.S. task force. To fill that gap, we stood up the, the combined information and effects fusion cell. And really what we looked at is the three levels of interoperability. That first level is that human interoperability. It is getting everybody under the same tent, operating side by side, and working off of that same battle rhythm. Understanding you know, skills, capabilities, um, terms, references, just day-to-day -day activities, and building what I think is that really the core of any relationship, which is trust, you know, through that human interoperability. Then we came the technical interoperability, and we'll pause just for one second for an announcement. to make an announcement for the uh, main hall. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For our full conference attendees, you'll want to start making your way back to the general session room for our afternoon session that begins at 1400. If you would start making your way back to the general session. Pardon the interruption and have a great rest of your afternoon. You gotta wait for the third set of chimes. All right, so uh, the next thing we looked at really was technical interoperability. And General Flynn talked about this and, and Yusasak talked about this as well. Sometimes with security classification guidance, it's tough, right? Like, like what can you share and at what level can you share it? Well, we recognize quickly and why we really, the kind of the joint force, uh, but you know, us being the, the catalyst with the CIFC was what can we do if we drive this down to the lowest level? If we build an impact level two network, a unclassified network, to be able to establish that network, leave it on, and then have both US joint and then NOLCOM joint 
partners be able to plug into that network. And that's what, the, uh, that's what our, our comms team did. The next thing was, well, what can we use that is unclassified to help us understand the environment? And you'll see around the, the green lettering that says SIFSI Unclassified Network with just multiple kind of open source or experimental or industry you know, level systems, whether that be C-Vision to look at transponders you know, on the, uh, you know, in the Luzon Strait, whether it be wide ISR discovery um, in order to look at, hey, how can I use an unclassified system to build a collection plan? Uh, commercial satellite using um, basically multiple sources for commercial satellite using Royce Geo as well, pulling in FMV that is unclassified or pulling in the ability to pull in RF as well. How do I pull all that in and be able to start making sense of that at the unclassified level? And really what we found out was, was really quite fascinating. So when you had unclassed data shared in an unclass common operating picture, and really more importantly, an, un, uh, an unclassified common intelligence picture, you just understood your environment. And then what you would see would be anomalies. So for a good example is, and you would see areas where you'd see a lot of uh, commercial vessels. And then you'd see these, these blank spots where there are no vessels at all. Well, why are there no vessels? Well, if I was an adversary vessel, would I have my transponder on? No. If I was a commercial vessel, would I bypass that area? I probably would. So you're able to find some of these anomalies um, in the environment. So that allowed for a collection plan to be developed. Well, let's send out assets, whether they be US or Filipino, that we can release in order to understand that environment. And really doing that combined analysis that's in that second square. And just starting to look based off of FMV, commercial imagery, whether it be sending a maritime patrol from the Filipino Navy out to, uh, uh, out to look, and then being able to increase our awareness. And those are some real photos that we were able to pull just based off of that process. So then what that allows is, of course, you know, a, a shared network at the lowest level, building human interoperability as you develop that, building technical interoperability as we just start looking at how these systems work and how our computers are plugging in, Filipino computers are plugging in, and then ultimately changing that into procedural interoperability. How do we sense, make sense, and be able to make decisions? Um, so something that was, that was really critical. And so to this day, so we started that at the end of March, and that currently exists today and will throughout Salakaneev TAC2, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to continue because part of interior lines that is so important is the network. You know, oftentimes we think interior lines, we think supplies, we think of depots, but oftentimes we think about the network. How do you establish a network? Leave the network on. Therefore, you know, oftentimes the hardest part of an operation is initial occupation, trying to build the network, and then when we're done with that operation, we break that network down. How do we use ideas such as these in order to try to enable an always-on network? And then uh, Captain Matty Suba, who's, who's over here, wrote a phenomenal article about this SIFC. So for those in our media or those that are, that are interested, please feel free to, to scan that QR code and, and take a look at it. It describes what I just uh, talked about. Okay, with that, let's go next slide, please. All right, and then finally, I'd like to put up just some uh, key observations, some that we already talked about. The first one is we really do provide a unique capability to the joint force. And really the fact that we are specifically tied to that joint force, we are one headquarters that synchronizes both non-kinetics, kinetics, protection, and sustainment in order for that joint force, joint force commander to achieve a very specific effect. Uh, second is that pathways and experimentation cannot be binary, and we already discussed that, how important it is that every pathways operation should have an experiment as a part of it, and every experiment should be pushed forward to a pathways operation to learn about the environment. Um, Multi-operations require, multi-domain operations require interoperability. You know, it also a great conversation today in the big, uh, uh, in the big room about, you know, that needs to be integration over time, but certainly interoperability. How do we talk amongst each other with a common data fabric as a joint force, and then how do we do that as a combined force? Uh, MDTFs are critical to establishing interior lines, uh, as we discussed, and then uh, forward exercises. 
my experience, have been a really good opportunity to gauge a feedback loop into integrated deterrence. Um, and we had this conversation, I think it was at AUSA last October, of integrated deterrence is really hard to measure. Like, is it having the effect that you want? Um, right now, we see kind of being pushed forward the relationship that we're building, iterative operations turning into extended operations. There are some good positive indicators that we're seeing you know, towards integrated deterrence. Um, and then building trust, again, the bedrock of everything that we do. And we see that the relationships that, that we are building, and by we, I really mean Indopaycom, uh, USERPAC, VMDTFs, both first and third, um, just building those relationships and building trust within the joint force, with our partnered force, and being able to do that with frequency, with repetition, and do it over longer durations. Uh, and again, on behalf of third MDTF and our entire first MDTF team, um, I just really want to say thank you. I mean, it's been a very accelerated journey. I think uh, General Flynn also said it very well. Uh, this was a model where we built the formation, we put the formation forward, thinking we knew what may go in the formation, but as we technology uh, evolves, as our modernization evolves, we now have a formation that these technologies can go into that we're not forming around the technology. We are forming around the people, which is so important. And I think you'll really see that with 3rd MDTF. Again, just stood up this past summer and on an accelerated glide path way faster than first or second. And they are out there right now in Alaska performing operations as part of Northern Edge 23 uh, TAC-1 tech, tech um, and just very, very impressive of where they are from where they were just a, just a few short months ago. So again, thank you so much uh, for your time. I think we only have a couple of minutes that we could do some questions, but I have some of my teammates here. Uh, we do have third MDTF uh, represented as well, and I'd love to open it up if anyone uh, has a question. The perfect brief. <laughs> no questions. Okay, again, I really want to say uh, thank you. And I mean it when I say, like, it is a team effort. And it's not just the Army, it's not just the Joint Force, but it's also our industry, it's our allies and partners, it's our modernization enterprise that has made this successful. There are a lot of things that I'm supposed to remember in standing here. The first she told me, uh, which is probably most important, is that I'm not supposed to leave the podium. Uh, and anybody who knows me knows that I've got nervous feet. So this is me gripping the podium to make sure that I stay in place. I, I appreciate you all being here, your, your time that you're giving us here in this space, as well as your attention to the things I'm going to talk about. Um, I am the commander of the only core that is COCOM assigned. The only core of the four that's COCOM assigned. I'm assigned part of the Assigned Forces 4 Indo-Pacific Command. Further, OPCON down to United States Army Pacific because we're Army folks. What we do, though, is act as the only operational command in the theater of my size. There's nothing more scalable than an Army Corps. The Corps at present is made up of the 7th Infantry Division, the 11th Airborne Division, and the 25th Infantry Division here in Hawaii. We span from the Arctic all the way to the subtropics and the jungle. That's the footprint of our core. And sometimes I find myself when we start talking about maybe the Army stopped somewhere around Texas and really petered out around Kansas, that there is Army in Washington State. And that's where we sit right now. Um, but I also have to remind people that it's quicker to our pacing challenge from Alaska than it is any place else on the globe. And we have to remind people of that. So what is it that we do as an operational command? What I'm tasked with is not really the whole of integrated deterrence, but I like to think of the things that this Corps does is provide integrated assurance. And we consider that assurance of our friends, partners, and allies to be the component that our Corps can actually put our fingers on in terms of assuring our friends, partners, and allies, developing that network of friends, partners, and allies that leads to a deterrent effect. When we think about classic deterrence, we think about the entirety of the dime being employed in an effort. 
What I like to tell folks in our core is we've got to do our part. Part of that is our posture. How are we postured when we're forward? The vehicle that we use as part of our campaign is Pathways. What Pathways allows is for my core to be engaged in the region for eight to 10 months out of the year in places from India to Thailand to the Philippines. We're able to be there and assure not only our treaty allies, but our friends and partners in the region that we're going to be present. You know, we talk about interoperability a lot. And I think my job for USERPAC and by extension Indopaycom is to work as hard as I can whenever we're in the region to focus on human and procedural interoperability. The technological interoperability will happen as a matter of course. People have the things that they have. Uh, there are some cases where our partners, like in Thailand, they have strikers. That's easy because we've got strikers at Joint Base lewis McCord. We've got striker experts that can partner with the Security Forces Assistance Brigade to ensure that our posture is correct and that we're assuring our partners that we're going to be there to work alongside them. And it's not always solving tactical problems that we do when we're in the region. Sometimes we're solving problems that might be as simple as maintenance. To be able to be there with a partner and say, hey, don't spend any more money. We've already gotten this wrong before. Here's a new way to approach this problem. And it's those relationships that we build during pathways that in time of crisis or in time, God forbid, of conflict, that we can assure them that we're going to be present. Our theater army has theater enabling commands. And likewise, within the core, we have enabling capabilities. So I have an expeditionary MI brigade. I've got an ESC that's part of the core. There's a theater aviation element, a theater cab that sits on my base. There are fires formations like the 17th Field Artillery Brigade that sit in my space. What we receive by partnering in the region is an opportunity to experiment with things that we have and things that we might need to develop for the future that we might be better engaged in the region. Uh, you know, I was asked a question earlier about what's the biggest thing that you've gotten out of Pathways? And I think that the, the person that asked me the question expected me to say, well, we learned how we would maneuver in space and how we get from point A to point B. But what I told them was the cultural sensitivity that's developed for our soldiers as they rotate to places they've never been before. I mean, think about it. You're a young specialist in the Army, and somebody tells you you're going on UWS and you're going to India. Show of hands, who's been to India before? You raised your hand too fast. I was hoping to make the point by having you not raise your hand and say, well, our soldiers have been there. But I'll still say, our soldiers have been there. Our soldiers have been to Thailand. Our soldiers have been into Korea. Our soldiers have been down into the Philippines. And they, they might not even understand how to spell EDCA. But they've been there and they've been part of the effort which assures our friends, partners, and allies that our presence is sound and will be there. I think, too, that when we look at human interoperability, it comes with a bit of understanding of what's important in the nations where we go to. The core is able to provide that level of granularity that at higher levels, like at Indopaycom and at USERPAC, they might not be able to see. Because we're at the tactical edge in operational size formations, which give us a feel of the region. I think that we're also dealing with, and what we're able to find out over the course of our pathways, is that significantly we're going to be challenged by distance. We're based largely at Joint Base lewis McCord, but for us to get into the region, it's got to be productive, which is why we can only focus truthfully on human and procedural interoperability. But there's this tyranny of circles that we have to deal with. You can only get so far, so fast, to get to the places we need to be at. And that's why posture becomes increasingly important. What capabilities are we bringing forward when we're on pathways? How do we posture ourselves along with our partners to ensure that the things that we're doing have great effect? You'll see pictures up here of our soldiers, and you'll see a multitude of patches. But I want you to pay particular attention to the pictures that might flash with us alongside our partners. But our partners help us to defeat the tyranny of the circles that we deal with every day in the region. 
the way that we approach that in first core is through distributed command and control. We establish nodes which have a few things about them that number one, they allow us to be agile. Our nodes allow us to be resilient in the region and our nodes are also take advantage of what our partners have that we might be able to leverage. We recognize that we won't be able to get enough of us forward in the proper time to deal with conflict or crisis. So it's very important that we tailor our packages that go forward that we might be able to best engage with what our partners have that we can take advantage of. We don't have any permanent basing that the core can, can avail itself of in the region. So it's always important that we look to partner at the lowest level possible, whether that be functionally aligning ourselves or with the size of our forces or the type forces that are forward. Um, Colonel Wazinski is a member of the 7th Infantry Division. They are striker equipped. The 112 Striker Regiment in Thailand takes great advantage when we can get the 7th ID on pathways forward to partner with them at the lowest level where our partners can take best advantage of our knowledge of maintenance and training and we can learn from them the region. We've got to have those kind of linkages that allow us to best understand the environment that we're going to be employed in. And whether that be pathways during competition, whether that be in conflict, or whether it be in crisis. I think another thing that the Corps has been able to do over our time of experimenting with distributed command and control is to understand that the network and its importance to our ability to prosecute competition, which requires our presence, in the future. We understand that we're going to have to be able to communicate. We understand that data, which is going to be the coin of the realm in the future, because that's going to help us to make decisions, quality decisions, quicker. Uh, it, it's going to be omnipresent. And in order for us to have this omnipresent data environment, we've got to start to shape the networks that are available. We won't ever be concerned with the transport. What we want to do is state a requirement for access to data. Our problems are largely from fort to port to the AOR. And we've got to have data that's available to us all the way throughout that pathway. Think about having a partner in the region that can tell you about what's going on in the region before you get there. Being able to take best advantage again of what our partners do so that we don't have to do it ourselves. And then our partners being able to do the same with us. We don't want our relationship in the region to ever be transactional. It can't be that for us to be successful. We've got to give back into the region as well. And that thing that we're giving is the assurance that we're going to be there when we need it. Uh, competition requires presence. And if our partners don't want us there, then we can't be present and we can't compete. But the best way that we can compete is by assuring our partners and our friends in the region that we're going to be there. Assurance is powerful. And again, if we take it down to its base level, it's those human relationships that we build over time through our campaigning effort that is Pathways. It's understanding how our partners fight. And by fight, I don't mean actually martial things. How do they, how does their army run? What's important to them? What paths are they pursuing in their forces? I had a great opportunity to sit and talk with General Bronner the last time I was in the Republic of the Philippines. And to understand from him the path that his army's on enables us to be better the next time we go into the region. And to understand what they can actually bear of this large 2,400 man force that I lead, what can they actually bear in their nation? And what's productive for them when we're there? We can't afford anymore by virtue of the circles that we exist in to just do the things that are important to us. We've got to look to the region and see what's important there. I'm not sure where we're at on time. I'm good, okay. But uh, what I'm most excited about is as our core continues to figure out ways to be engaged in the region or the things that we're doing back home, we recognize the fact that everybody doesn't have to be forward. That's a markedly different idea from what's existed over the past 21 years or so in our army. Everybody went. When we were going to Afghanistan and Iraq, everybody went. I think sometimes it was because we don't want to have to call you in later on. So we're just going to take everybody right after the bat. 
what we're looking at as we engage in the region is what actually needs to be there. What do we need to accomplish over the course of a pathways? Again, it's eight to 10 months and probably as many locations across the region. So how are we productively engaging in that place? And I think that's a, that's a different approach to the way that we fought over the past 20 years. Because the partners are the preeminent relationship that we've got to develop there. That integrated assurance that's offered at the operational level, which is what I'm responsible for, is absolutely imperative that we grasp onto that. Again, I don't do integrated deterrence, never will, as a core commander. But what I can do is I can do integrated assurance to make sure that I'm tying the elements of the dime together from my position to ensure that our friends, partners, and allies in the region are wanting to be part of a network that produces a deterrent effect. That's what I've come to realize. We're not just going out to hang out in the region. We've got to accomplish things. Our, we have to prove our value every time we step out the door. And this is from the sergeant all the way up to the three-star general. We've got to accomplish things when we're there. Regardless of the challenges that we have in our own force, we've got to accomplish those human and procedural goals every time we step out. And then I might be a good steward of your time and we might you know, prevent this log jam that's developing. Uh, I think I'm gonna go ahead on and transition to your questions at this time. Well, first of all, thank you, thank you for being here today. My question is on the force. With the longer, you know, basic AIT, OSIT training, how is that, you know, working out for the, the, the force? Well, I, I will tell you, um, sir, um, one of the things that we see is um, we're also extending that line when we get folks to our, in, our installation. Because what we want to do is we want to try to develop, like, Yi, do you speak any foreign languages? Yee, here's some things that we need you to understand about going into the region. Uh, here's the countries that you're going to go to based on the unit you're going to. Here's where we see you being employed. I, I think that what we're finding is the soldiers that we're getting out of the, the base now yeah. are far more prepared than, than soldiers were when I first came in the Army in 1990. For example, our soldiers who are spending a lot more time in the base training in the institutional Army they're coming and driving change in the force. For example, if you look at our integrated weapons training strategy, we had soldiers that were showing up to infantry brigades, and Leo could tell you about this, who had been firing the new tables, and we hadn't even really made the full transition in the active force yet. So there are things that they're getting in the base now that are sort of hardening those targets, if you will, before they come to the active force. So I have not seen, in my experience, any any problems or any implications of them staying longer, I think they're coming to us better prepared to soldier. That, that's what I was hearing. I'm just curious as to whether or not you were seen at that. Yeah, no, soldiers are, soldiers are always going to be phenomenal. That's good. And uh, their superpower is their willingness to volunteer to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. All right, that's the softball. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Again, if you ask a question, you're not going to hear yourself on the speakers, but you will be immortalized on DVIDs because they're recording it. So make sure you ask smart questions. Sir, for uh, everyone's benefit, Leo Wazinski, the, the 7th ID Deputy Commander for Ops. Sir, as you look to further distribute it, command and control over the next year uh, of your command, what are the most critical capability gaps that you see uh, that you need to build in order to enable, uh, as you, you talk about, the, the ability to, to fight free for subordinate commands, yeah. but provide the, the requisite centralized control um, and visualization. Yeah. It, it, thank you for that question, Leo. And, and I'll start with the last thing you said, visualization. In order for us to fight distributed, you have to be able to see what I'm thinking, truthfully. And by that I mean I've got to have the tools that are going to allow me to portray for you my thoughts so that we can work in a collaborative fashion as I'm trying to honor the contract between us of what I've got to do as a core to enable you to fight free. And so that's going to require some definition. What I believe is, is that as an operational commander, my job is to set conditions 
across the warfighting functions for my subordinate divisions so that they can fight free. There's a contract that says that you need sustainment in this place at this time, I'm going to get it there. There's a contract that says these are the targets you're asking me to destroy so that you can maneuver. Well, I've got to do that. So across the warfighting functions, I believe that there is this need in the future to quickly set conditions that we might be able to act. Whoever can see first, sense first, understand first, and act decisively in conflict is going to win. I would respectfully submit to you that those same things are true in competition and in crisis. The ability to see, sense, understand, and act is paramount. So I've got to be able to do those things. The tools that I require, again, my job is to state requirements, not to talk about a thing. If there's anything that's got a registered trademark on it, I shouldn't be talking about it. I should tell you I require a terrestrial-based capability that allows me to speak or transmit across LEO, GEO, and even space. That's what I require. If I say thing X, registered trademark, that's not the right way to go at this because the Army does things at scale. So what I have to do is take best advantage of the things that I have right now to produce an effect. That effect that I've got to produce is setting the conditions for your division and the other two that you might be able to fight free. The biggest challenge we're going to have right now is in experimentation. I believe we've got to bring more things to this region because in this region there are frictions that don't exist elsewhere. In this region, the pacing challenge is here. And one of the biggest pacing challenges is not a single nation, but it's the ability to sew together this network of friends, partners, and allies to great effect. That's going to be a challenge, too. There's a host of relationships that exist. Some of them are bilats, um, but to develop in the land domain a competent organization of nations that are pointed toward a free and open Indo-Pacific is also going to be a challenge in the future, Leo. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Leo. Hey, and just for everybody's edification, I'm basically wearing a parka right now, okay? So... We're going to count to like 3,000 in a minute here, and if nobody asks a question, we're going to move on. Keep that in the D-bits, because that was heck of funny. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. Good afternoon, sir. Dave Sink from L3 Harris. Uh, appreciate the information. Uh, obviously, at the operational level, you do have different challenges from the other corps, whether it's physical challenges, distance, cultural, you talked about that, or the thousands of islands that you have to deal with. But... As you see, we've got a lot of industry partners here. You're incorporated into 30 plus exercises over the year. Oh, by the way, you're still doing real world operations. At the end of the day, it's all about the soldier under the rucksack with that poncho. What do you want from industry to help you get to that next fight? So um, for our core, what we call 2021 to 2022, we call that the year of discovery. We wanted to try to take an opportunity to, to understand better how we engage in the region. And again, it's not with all 2,400 members of my staff going forward to Country X and being engaged. Uh, what we decided we needed to do was we needed to distribute ourselves across functions, across capabilities, to be able to be in a smaller footprint and exist under the noise of a place. What I require from industry is to help us to understand how we might be able to keep people in the relative sanctuary of home, go forward with a smaller element, and still remain engaged in both places. You see, that's a challenge. Because you're trying to look at what, what can be borne by the networks that we have now. Is cloud the way of the future? I don't know. But we've got to work on that. Uh, and can we do that at scale across the entirety of the Army? There's four cores. And some solutions are so exquisite and so boutique that they're not going to meet what the Army needs to do in time. Industry needs to remain flexible to the needs and the requirements that will be stated by virtue of experiences. The great thing about this region is I would invite you to piggyback on things that we're doing. You said it yourself, 30-plus exercises a year that we're involved in. And, and, and another challenge that sort of piggybacks on what Leo asked and what you're talking about is, I've got to find 
creative ways through the tools given me to manage my purse tempo. My purse tempo is off the charts right now and I can't sustain that. And purse tempo is the number of nights that I keep somebody from putting their, pill their head on the pillow in the place they call home. But the requirements will remain the same. But I've got to find a way to do that and I think technology is the way to be able to do that. There are advise and assist tools that are out there right now, but I think if you could take those advise and assist tools and take them up one notch, then we could partner at distance by maintaining contact. That in that contact layer, being forward, our presence is powerful. It's palpable when you get to a place and you see a leader and they go, I remember you from last time you were here. Good to see you again. Here's what's changed since you were last here. And that industry's got to help us out with too heavy load, but I'm thinking about it. I spend a lot of time noodling on how, noodling means thinking. Um, I spend a lot of time noodling on how I get the experience that my people need while caring for them to keep them where they ought to be and keep them connected to the region. There's a thing that does that. I know it. It's out there. Thanks, Dave. One more? Yes, sir. Hi, Ted Cummings with MuleSoft. Was curious if you benchmark off of any commercial entities that are doing global operations in the Pacific, not necessarily to buy their solution, but to model your operations off of the things they're doing in the region. Yeah, I would tell you, if you look at, um, I'll, I'll just, quick story here within the time allotted and remaining to me. So I moved from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, vicinity of my parents' house after about six, 15 years at Fort Bragg. So at 53, I left my parents' house for good. Um, much to my wife's chagrin, I can't eat two dinners anymore. Um, but I got to Washington State and I had to set up EOS routers. I don't think there's anything wrong with me saying that they're EOS routers, okay? I set up a mesh network. That would be the best way based on something I said previously. I established a mesh network in my home. And because I was in the house by myself, I went to the four floors to see how strong the signal was on my cell phone. And when I went to the basement, I still had a good signal. And then when I went to the fourth floor of the house, still had a signal. And then I said, what happens, again, in the house, by myself, no cable yet. I go, what if I take one of these out? Can I still communicate? And I could. And I said, why can't I do that in the core? Because it's already, there's an application that does that. It creates a mesh network. Well, imagine a world where I'm deploying forward, but I'm existing in a mesh network, a powerful mesh network. I don't care. I'm transport agnostic. I don't care if it's on 5G, I don't care if it's in the cloud, I don't care if it's HF, I don't care. What I care about is that requirement, that I operate zero trust environment, that I operate in a transport agnostic fashion and I can get to where I need to and I can move data freely within that. Quality data, not all the data, quality data. Now you ask the question of how have other people done this? If you look at a company that sounds like Tamazon, but not, they are able to move things around the world. You can order something today and it's gonna to be there tomorrow. You can order something tonight and it'll tell you how soon it can be there. Our distribution has to be flexible, but that's why we had to get smaller because you can move smaller things faster. That's why we have to recognize what exists in the region now. What can our partners do so that we can shape the capabilities that move forward quickly and then we can have a means of sustaining that over time. We can have clear presence that's forward. So yes, sir, there are numerous examples. There are legion examples within industry that heretofore we've come to industry and said, hey, here's a problem, fix this. Well, now we can say, you've already solved that. How do we take best advantage of what you've already done? That makes sense. Okay, I think my time's up right now. Everybody smile, because people are taking pictures. All right. Hey, thank you all for your time and attention. I appreciate it truly. And thanks for being here at LAMPAC. And uh, thank you for what you all do to support us in your army. Thank you.
For all those that are in attendance that are not part of the organization, you know, I'm joined by members of our battalion command teams that are here uh, to also assist me in answering in any questions based on the level of detail that you'd like to get into during these, uh, during these next 30 minutes. I'm grateful for the opportunity to introduce you to or to refresh you on the mission and activities of the 5th Security Forces Assistance Brigade and the outstanding soldiers that make up the body of advisors that are doing the work of contributing to in integrated deterrence on a daily basis west of the international dateline. I think it's appropriate uh, for this discussion to open with a quote from the chairman of the J Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, who was the, the I guess you could call him the grandfather of the, of the SFAB, the, the, the one that started the concept of the SFAB, and that he said during a press engagement several years ago, he said, you cannot measure a human heart with a machine, you have to be there. This simple statement was the impetus for the SFAB concept and continues to define and is our hallmark on the partnership building cap capability that SFABs provide to geographic combatant commanders. I'd like to spend the next couple of minutes sharing with you how we as a unit contribute to the concept of integrated deterrence, how we facilitate achieving General Flynn's campaign goals in the Pacific, and what we have done up to this point as a young unit. If we are new to you, allow me to quickly review our story. We are one of the Army's newest units built in 2019, activated and regionally aligned in 2020, employed in 2021, and since then have been operating persistently in the Pacific with a host of allies and partners. Our unit is relatively small, with no more than 800 soldiers, in which a third is training individually, a third is building team proficiency, and a third is in theater conducting our portion of security cooperation that being security forces assistance, defined as the unified action to generate, employ, and sustain local host nation or regional security forces in support of a legitimate authority. We are a purpose-built formation, congressionally authorized to provide advice, support, liaise capability, and provide assessments to the militaries of authorized countries. While our conventional forces are constrained in working with partners relative to mission and time, the SFAB's purpose and mission is defined by our ability to work with others. Training with partners builds my readiness, and in doing so, my team gets better by being persistently immersed in the region. It is work done by very special soldiers who volunteer to do the work that builds a security architecture that General Flynn has spoken about before between the diplomatic and military instruments of power that enable conflict to be deterred, war to be prevented, and a state of peace to be the goal we seek to maintain. So in turn, how does such a small unit make contribution to USERPAC's efforts of integrated deterrence, of making the cost of coercion and conflict prohibitive on our competitors? Well, this gets back to General Milley's statement. Let's discuss the idea of building trust with our partners. In our very short time of working in the region, nothing has become more apparent to us than the value of being with our partners at all time, again, persistently. We are able to exchange ideas on training, share the hardships of training together, and continue to build an enduring advantage for both of us in the proficiency we achieve to meet our shared challenges. Our greatest achievements to date have been with our partners in Mongolia, shepherding them through an enhanced training path in preparation for off-continent training, in Thailand, with our work with their newly activated striker formations, and within the Philippines, expanding our presence in support of Balakatan and Salak Nib. In Indonesia last year, one of our maneuver advisor teams helped prepare numerous battalion-sized elements of the TNIAD to integrate into Super Garuda Shield, a transformed army-to-army -army bilateral exercise into a massive joint and multinational exercise involving over 14 countries. In FY23 and 24 going forward, we will continue to receive authorizations to, to train in over 18 locations, some precedented and others as a first-time opportunity to develop relationships as we grow our contacts in Oceania and in Southeast Asia. Again, our persistent presence, again, that word persistent being the key theme to what we do, enables us to be USERPAC's forward edge of campaigning. We provide feedback on the progress of our partners, better inform needs and desires for security cooperation cases, and are able to inform our brigades and battalions on the best way to prepare for a major training event being that nexus to ensure the training event is a valuable rehearsal 
of interoperability for training audiences. If there are two things I want you to take away from our contributions to integrated deterrence, again, it's persistent presence and training. It is our foundation of how we contribute to General Flynn's three initiatives to bolster the network of partners and allies in the region to ensure land power is ready to undergird the security architecture we need to de-escalate tensions and return crisis to competition. Those initiatives being the generation of readiness through JPMRC, the application of readiness through campaigning and theater through Operation Pathways, and the third, the sustainment of readiness in theater through the development of joint and interior lines. Fifth SVAB supports our partners and facilitates their success in intending JPMRC by using our advisors in theater. For Operation Pathways, we provide that support in advance of the arrival of conventional forces to countries to conduct operational rehearsals in support of contingencies. Our value is our ability to liaise with U.S. country teams at the embassy with the inbound leadership and being the key nexus for U.S. and partner forces throughout the rehearsal. But let me quickly return to the JPMRC topic that I just discussed. The readiness and training proficiency we achieved at JPMRC is intended to be harvested and applied in pathways during the conduct of those same rehearsals in the very terrain where crisis or conflict could emerge. Establishing and having a presence in this terrain helps us deny that advantage from competitors and maligned actors. With the departure of forces from pathways, we carry on the hard work with partners in developing the concept and training objectives for the next iteration of U.S. forces that arrive. And to build joint interior lines is to work the sustainment and logistics needed to repeatedly deliver personnel and equipment to key locations observing U.S. and partner entry law and policy. So to arrive training partner units at JPMRC with their equipment, facilitating the delivery of pathways units, knowing key locations for the storage of equipment, and the movement of our forces back and forth over the IDL requires continuous management by sustainment experts to leverage every piece of military and civilian assets to ensure the safety of our people and the security of our equipment. This effort ensures that there is institutional knowledge and habits being built into our formations to overcome the unusual tyranny of distance unique to the Pacific so that we can deliver on our commitments to support our friends in times of crisis and conflict. This is a lot of work for all of us and the Land Power Pacific family to work on, but our perseverance and commitment to our allies and partners ensures they know we have a willingness to prepare and to share the burden if we face our worst day in the region. I leave you with this, that today there are over 130 5th SFAB advisors in the Pacific at this time, and many more from our sister brigades are currently doing that hard work I mentioned. Synergizing the training for JPMRC, applying readiness during pathways, and building joint interior lines, all to put us in positions of advantage to be a partner of choice and to build trust with nations so that our competitors are denied that same space and disincentivized from employing coercive methods. There is nothing more important than our ability to partner and live side by side with our friends and constantly train. Doing those daily rehearsals for crisis and conflict to maintain the stability of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Thank you for your time. Mahalo ni nuloa. We have time to take a couple of questions. Sir, I am a member of industry. I work for a small business. Uh, we do language translation. I'm wondering, let me ask a softball question. How do you see industry helping uh, the SFAB mission moving forward? You know, I, I think that speaks to the question of, of, uh, of what General Flynn talks about, the, the three components of interoperability, human, uh, technical, and, and procedural. And so us being on the ground with our partners and allies and understanding the, the various numbers of different pieces of equipment, numbers of, uh, of ways that we need to be interoperable with them and our U.S. equipment, I, I think that's the window um, in which we could explore understanding where we could uh, develop uh, and pursue industry solutions to close that gap between ourselves and that partner that, that we need to. As we bring them over to JPMRC, as we train with them, as we understand that there's some technological gap that we need to that we need to close that we could that we could uh, solve with a, with a commercial solution. Um, so us knowing that um, is is vital, but we can only know that going back to the same talking points I delivered in my in my uh, in my narrative here, and that only comes about from us being with them day by day, 
uh, week by week, month by month, and persistently training with them to understand that. If we're only there episodically, if we only touch them once a year, twice a year, three times a year, we may begin to know that in terms of what industry solutions we need to pursue. But I would be skeptical if, if we could develop a solution that could actually stick over time uh, because we would just not have that awareness and understanding about what they needed, what we needed to make that connection, and how fast we needed to make, make that for, to facilitate additional training and rehearsals. Jesse Stone with Industry. Um, I'm wondering what kind of steps are being taken to encourage interoperability from a communications perspective with partner forces? Okay. Uh, you, you know, right now, uh, you know, again, I would say that it's in the conduct of certain training exercises that we're conducting stateside uh, with partner and allies that we know that in which they can't bring their communications equipment, that they're limited in bringing that, you know, for, you know, a variety of, a variety of reasons. Um, so again, it, it's, it's, it's our recommendation uh, to them and it's our recommendation to our allies and partners to, to, to take on uh, uh, concepts and ideas about how they can potentially cl close that gap to attend those same training events um, in the future. I appreciate you all attending and uh, I hope to see you all again in the future. So thank you. This is the Non-Commissioned Officer and Shoulder Programs Dinner. Directorate is pleased to welcome you to the Senior Enlisted Leader Forum at the Association of the United States Army's Land Pack Symposium and Exhibition. The theme for our forum today is the role of the Non-Commissioned Officer Corps in land power across the Indo-Pacific. I'd like to remind our audience to please silence your cell phones and also start thinking about what questions you have for our guests today. We'll have an incredible panel and we'll start with a fireside chat prior to that panel. I'd also like to express a warm welcome to our international peers and uh, to name a few of our senior non-commissioned officers from our, our fellow uh, militaries across the Pacific. We have Warrant Officer Flemingham from Australia. Sir Major? Yay! Command Sergeant Major Adnan from Maldives. <laughs> Sergeant Major Lee from Taiwan. <laughs> Warrant Officer Fatia from Tonga. <laughs> Warrant Officer Tedrai from Fiji. And Chief Warrant Officer Carney from the United States, Un I mean, United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I almost, I almost messed that one up, yeah. Well, he's here enough. Yeah, I mean, he's here enough. That's right. Well, thank you, know, you, you know the stories coming, for being here. We appreciate, and as you heard the boss say in his opening remarks, that we will never do this alone. And we fight with our coalition partners across the Pacific to bring unity and peace and defend our honor of our countries. I'd like to uh, open this up by having our senior listed forum begin with a fireside chat, uh, followed by a panel consisting of a very diverse group of senior non-commissioned officers. And let me begin by welcoming our distinguished guest for the first person this forum today, the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston, SMA. Awesome. Okay, uh, you know, if you know me, I'm always off script. I do want to recognize, I don't think we, we missed uh, the Singapore Sergeant Major of the Army, so thank you for being here too. I want to say thank you. That's awesome. Well, Sergeant welcome. It's always good to have you uh, here at the Association of the United States Army, and you bless our presence on many occasions. Um, you know, we, uh, we joke all the time, so ever since the first time I came here and SMA took over, we couldn't have a forum without talking about ACFT. And I promise you, <laughs> we are not going to talk about ACFT today, so I'm not. Gonna, well, I'm sure maybe the question will come up and you'll have to. Um, but we're going to talk about it. the role of the non-commissioned <laughs> officer. And SMA, I'd like to turn the floor over to you for a few open comments and uh, to address the group before we get into a fireside chat. And just a reminder, your questions, uh, both the microphone and we have Miss Christine in the back. She has question cards. If you'd like a question card, just please raise your hand. She will get those filled out. But you're also welcome to use the microphone and approach those to ask the SMA questions uh, at the conclusion of our chat. SMA? 
Um, I'm really uh, excited to be here, you know, especially as I, I got just a few more months left in the seat. And, and before I even start, I have to tell this story because you already introduced him as the Sergeant Major of the Army, uh, Paul. So, uh, and this may come out later, Paul is uh, a good friend and has been to my house. But unfortunately for Paul, he's like, hey, let's go run the Army 10 mile. I'm like, Paul, oh, sure. Uh, but Sergeant Simmons is coming with us and she's a really good runner. So run 10 miles. And I think General Potter was outside the house and she walks up and Paul walks up and shakes her hand and he goes, hi, I'm the Sergeant Major of the Army. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she's like, I don't think that's you. <laughs> so, um, but with those opening comments and how you build trust um, you know, and just having wonderful group of individuals that I've worked with uh, throughout my career. And I've got many fond memories of different NCOs and different countries and building those relationships where we have these wonderful stories. I think that's what it really means to be in the military. And that's what's great about having this forum. Um, you can invite those people to your house and you'll build some relationships over time. And it does take time. And when I look about uh, around the room, it, you you have a just this you know great wealth of knowledge, and so that panel after this is going to be phenomenal. So I'm really excited to be here, and I can't wait to talk about this topic. Uh, and I'm really proud to be with you today. It's awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you, SMA. We appreciate you having with us. So, Sergeant Major, you have experience in the Pacific. You know, you were previously a Corps Sergeant Major here. Uh, we'll talk about that. But our theme today is the role of the non-commissioned officer in land power in the Indo-Pacific. Um, how can senior enlisted leaders enable mission command across the Pacific and when it's geographically spread? How, how do we do that? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question. When you talk about mission command, um, number one, um, I do want to caution everybody, um, you're not the commander. <laughs> so, I, and I really put that, and I usually tell all U.S. You know, star majors, is start with that. And so, um, you're, how do you enable mission command? you're not the commander and you're not you don't have those roles and authorities and when i look at my time as first corps how do i enable mission command well you can be an enabler you just got to be out there and where do the where is the commander do you always have to sit right there with the commander um, you're probably not enabling mission command if you're sitting right next to your boss that's especially in the pacific it's so large so diverse so many other places you enable that, in my personal opinion, is sometimes you gotta be where your boss isn't. What are those things that you can see that he or she can't see? And the higher you go, the harder this gets. Uh, I'm being honest with you. The chief, you know, he's he just it's been all over the uh, the Pacific, he'll see things, he'll talk to certain people. I'm gonna talk to different groups. And that's how you enable the command. It's not by talking to the same people. You're, it's by talking to different groups. Well, you know, he'll, he's going to talk to the, the chief of defense or who's running, you know, the Philippine Army or, or the, you know, whatever it is in that country. Uh, and I'm going to talk to the soldiers, you know. And when he talks about, and he'll talk about things, if you've heard the chief talk about, he'll talk about, you know, capabilities. And then at the end, he talks about will. And when I go down and I'm looking at soldiers from whatever country, you know, I'll probably be looking for, do they have the will to fight? And that's how I would enable my boss. It's not because I'm gonna sit there and, and go everywhere they go. It's I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna check on our soldiers. Do they have the will to do exactly what we've asked them to do? And that's on one side. And then on the other side, you know, same thing with any country. Uh, they may have, the, do they have the capabilities at the, the junior level? But also, do we think they have the will to fight? Because that's come up a lot in Russia, in Ukraine. Fight. Yeah. Do they have the will? So that's how you enable it. Um, you take the commander's intent and see what they're trying to do in that operation, and then go to a different level and say, hey, is that really what's happening at the lower echelons? Because what's happening up here and what's being said, and that's what uh, I found all across the Indo Pacific, may not be what's happening at the ground troops. And that's what's great about, you know, Sergeant Majors. You can go see that. And, I, and that's just my opinion about that's one way to enable it. You know, you've got a lot of other people to help you do that. Um, and then having, you know, a network of within the U.S. Army. You know, you've got 8th Army. I think Rob Cobb. I've seen him. Sean Carnes. And how do you talk to them if you can't be there? 
and you get that feedback and you trust that they're actually telling you they've seen the ground truth in those areas. Uh, so there's two ways. You personally, by being out there in a different level, but it's also by enabling the SAR majors in those locations uh, and what are they seeing. Absolutely. So I'm going to do this. this morning, General Flynn in the open forum talked about trust and how important those relationships are across, especially a very dispersed uh, geographic area. So, how do we, what does trust mean for the senior NGO population? How do we operationalize it across the universe? Yeah. Well, that's a, a really good question. I actually had it in a, a, a leader forum just a few minutes ago. And the, the actual question was, um, you know, how do you move, how do you view trust in a bilateral agreement? And then how do you do trust in a multilateral agreement? And what I said is, believe it or not, the, the larger that group gets, the harder it is. Um, I think with trust, it takes time. Uh, so that's to really answer your question, to operationalize it, and I just use our group. Once a month, we're on a Teams call with the, you know, the Five Eyes. And if we, and, and I'm not, you know, trying to say that's all important, but if I say that's 100, um, do we have the same conversations? So the larger that group, the harder the trust is to build that deep relationship that comes with trust. Uh, because Paul and I have known each other the longest, and if Moo was here, same thing. If Moo called me from New Zealand right now and said, I need you to do this, if I had to buy my own play ticket, I would go do it. I mean, a wonderful person. I'm, you know, been. That's the kind of trust you want. Um, and I think the larger that group gets, the harder it is. Um, you you want to kind of keep it a small, tight group that you say, hey, no matter what, when they call, I'm going to be there. Um, and that's how you kind of start to operationalize it. And we, we kind of figured it out. I think it was COVID. I think Gab started it, by the way. Um, and he said, hey, let's get on this phone call. We can't travel anymore. How do we build, keep those relationships up? Um, and we saw that we couldn't fly and see each other, so we started the Teams call. And that's kind of how we operationalized. How do we keep that open communication? Um, so when you need some help and what we found is that we all have the same problems. Uh, Jim's a little bit more unique up again. Sometimes he's like, we did this and we're learning a lot from them. It's like, man, hopefully we don't do that. But um, what I'm saying is you find ways to connect when you're talking about trust. It takes time. That's right. And that's the biggest thing, how I would say to operationalize trust across you know very large group of bodies of water and, and countries. It takes time. And then how do you find ways to connect routinely, not once a year at Yamasakura, not once a year at Lampac. It's those routine touch points. And I think when you get those touch points with those in your area, um, you'll start to build trust. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's unique that, you know, as you mentioned, you talk about um, bringing all the team together and you all have the same challenges and soldiers are really universally across the land are the same um, but being able to share the some of the solutions to those challenges in those forums I think helps build the trust and and understanding that your your partners are both sharing the same experiences uh, and the same successes and know that they have each other's back SMA, you talked about at your level now as a Sergeant Major of the Army, but um, I want to uh, capitalize on your experience as the I Corps or the First Corps Sergeant Major as the I Corps Sergeant Major or First Corps Sergeant Major um, corrected me. Uh, this Dan, I, I don't say bad things about Fourth ID, yeah. so no, let's no, not no. go with First I'm Corps. Not, okay? I'm not. Um, <laughs> but can you explain what it looked like from your position as the First Corps Sergeant Major, and then has it changed from then till now? Yeah, we were really good back then. Uh, yeah. I don't know what's going on now. <laughs> they a little bit better. Yeah, they're, they're probably doing much better now. Uh, well, I tell you, yeah, it has changed dramatically. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of tie this together. But, you know, at the time, you know, at the time when I was first corps, we still had the other two corps rotating in and out of Iraq. Um, so my time as first corps, you know, we kept doing these exercises. We try to figure out this thing called pathways at the time you know um i think it was general brooks i think came in and said hey let's call all these little exercises one big thing and tie them together um so we were trying to figure out what pathways was you know and and how that was how that we we're going to operationalize all the exercises and we called it a series of pathways so that was in you know it's in 
infancy at the time. Um, but again, we still have this other army thing going on called Iraq and these corps rotating in and out. Um, still had Afghanistan. Uh, and then we had these exercises. So even though we said, um, hey, this is, you know, this is the number one challenge. This is the pacing challenge in China, in the Indo-Pacific, and how do we put our resources in it? We kept, as an army, we kept being pulled away to these other things. So at the time, I had a, a deep connection, and hopefully he still does, with the, the Forces Command, that's usually the supplier for all those things outside of the Indo-Pacific. Um, but the, all the missions were still there. Um, and you know you're still doing you know Balakatan, Talisman Saber, all those exercises, but it was kind of overshadowed by what the oh kidding we're fighting and people are dying kind of moment. And now fast forward, like how does it change? Well, it changed a lot. Well, let's just see. And you believe it or not, it was Europe when Ru Russia invades Ukraine. In my opinion, that was like, hey, wait a minute. You know, these things actually could, this could, or could this actually happen in our, in our theater? I, I mean, would China actually do the same thing in Taiwan? And that's my opinion is that's how it's changed. It's like, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, believe it or not, that European theater, in my personal opinion, shaped more emphasis or over here. Or do we have the ammunition ready to go if this happens here? Do we have this? Are we do the Taiwanese have the will that we've seen uh, in the Ukrainian army? So we really started to look in this Indo-Pacific, and you know, First Corps was like, "Hey, what's what's First Corps doing?" <laughs> you know, it's like not that they forgot about me when I was First Corps, but it, it really has all, all our attention because that's the Pacific. And then, are we putting the resources there? Um, and you've seen what we've already done. I mean, just look, we've renamed uh, the Eleventh Airborne uh, the division. And we give them people to actually have a division, you know. And most people don't realize that they had, I think they had 50 people in the headquarters. <laughs> it's like, uh, I'm not sure what that, how's that's a division. <laughs> but, uh, but now, um, now they have more people. We assigned it. We, we're giving them the right equipment to fight in the Pacific. And that's how it's changed. It, it's, it's not just us saying it's the Prairie Theater. We are putting a lot of resources from the Department of Army there. Um, and more so than I think we have when I was the Corps Sergeant Major. Absolutely. I just want to remind our honest to start thinking about your questions. I'm only going to ask a few more. I'm not going to um, totally take over the conversation here because I want to involve your questions to the SMA. We have them for a limited amount of time today. But before we get to the audience, SMA, a couple more. You talked um, greatly about trust at Echelon. But for all the non-commissioned officers who are not here today that are from you know, being televised in or on the internet and seeing this later on is how important is it for our junior non-commissioned officers and our soldiers who work on these pathway missions throughout the theater to build trust at Echelon for them? Yes. Yeah. Um, normally, it's extremely important. I mean, it's, I would say it's the secret sauce in our army, um, this, this thing called trust. And, and there's two two types of trust, and normally we miss one. So normally when you hear this word called trust, uh, it's usually from, I would say, higher to lower. It's like, oh, you gotta trust me. Um, you know, you hear a platoon sergeant tell the first sergeant that, you know, why are you down here? You know, go away, just trust. Um, and, and then the other part though is the one most people forget about is the trust from um, subordinate to higher. <coughs> So you have to trust that my battalion, you know, Sergeant Major, my battalion commander, when given all the right information, are going to make the appropriate decision. And sometimes we don't think like, that. oh, you know, and, I, and the example I gave the, the forum was I had a brigade Sergeant Major. I said, I needed a staff sergeant for tasking. And he said, I don't have any staff sergeants. It's like, you don't have any staff sergeants in your old battalion. I knew that's not true, right? <laughs> so I, mean, I, I saw, I, you know, I see your man. Um, but what I talked about was that he didn't trust me uh, if he laid out all the reasons why I shouldn't pick his unit to take that staff sergeant. He didn't have the trust in me to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. And it was up to me as the brigade to fix that, not him. I had to say, here's how we do this. Um, and, but going back to what I said is about the secret sauce in our army. 
And now I just speak to the US NCOs in the room. We have great authority because our officers trust us. Never lose that trust. It is fleeting and could go in a, in a second. And we are great only because our officers say, you have all this authority, and then go do that. You know, in the United States Army, I run the nominative program. I mean, I think the vice might actually sign the paperwork at some point. I know he does, by the way. <laughs> so, but, but I run it. That is trust. And that goes from the sergeant major of the Army all the way down to the sergeant. If we don't trust our NCOs to be good squad leaders, they're not going to be squad leaders. If we don't trust that the first sergeant can be a good first sergeant and he can't do what they're being asked to do, our officers aren't going to trust us. So every being of our culture in the United States Army that is foundational to our NCO Corps starts at the base of trust. You take that away, you do not have a strong NCO Corps because they don't trust that you're going to do the mission, no matter what. So I, I think that's the, it is, you know, vitally important to who we are as a United States Army, especially with our NCOs. And we were talking about this in the other room, also about this trust. And I said, well, a lot of times NCOs in the United States Army, in my opinion, uh, talk to the wrong people. We love to talk to each other. <laughs> it's the same thing in the room. We're all in the same room. We're all NCOs. And I said, if you really want to start a program in a different country, we should start by talking to the leaders, the officers of that country, and said, do you trust your NCOs to execute a mission without you being there? And if you don't want that, then uh, you, know, you can go out and talk to the NCOs till you're blue in the face, but if they don't want that, in my personal opinion, been around the world, if the officers from that country don't trust their NCOs, you're just gonna be banging your head against the wall. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know what to tell you. So that's been my personal experience. But the good news is there are a lot of countries that do. Um, but I'd ask us, um, you know, I just remind us in the United States Army that this trust isn't forever. You got to earn that every day. Um, you know, you can't screw that up. Uh, but then in the, in the, you know, the greater picture of the countries, make sure that their officers, that's what they want for their army. If they don't, then you work within the means to what you got. But in, in my opinion, it all starts to trust. Yeah, very powerful message. I mean, it's spot on. And I know you focused a lot on our, our army, but uh, that's a universal message for our coalition partners because it, it, it's uniquely the same in every army. I mean, trust has to exist at Echelon um, in order for an organization to work. Um, and I think the most powerful thing you mentioned is that it's it's uh, it's not achieved, it's sustained. You got to work on it all the time. Yeah. That's me. I'm going to go off the subject of our uh, our Indo-Pacific focus here for a minute. Um, just because uh, we always have the opportunity to have the SMA on the stage, and I know that there's a lot of questions out there that may not apply to our theme today, and that's okay, but you mentioned SMA, and unfortunately, we only have you for a few more months as our Sergeant of the Army. What, what, what's unfortunate or fortunate? I don't know. Whichever you want to go with, Dan. Unfortunately. Yeah. No, I think <laughs> unfortunately. We were blessed. She's like, yeah, get rid of that. Get rid of that guy. Um, we were blessed to have your leadership, but what, what, what's your focus as you continue to, to drive towards the, the end of this mission? Uh, everything. <laughs> there's, yeah. a, there's a long list. Um, and I, I want to be clear, I, I don't have a, like a running tally and a list that ends when I'm the Sergeant Major of the Army. I've said this multiple times, I'll, I'll keep saying it to the end. If the Army stops or there's something I wasn't going to, that I was doing that ends with me, I should never have been doing it in the first place. If it's not good for the Army, I should not have been doing it. Um, so that's, that's who I 100% believe that. And the second thing is, if, we, if Mike Weimer isn't better than I am, I have failed to do my job. Uh, if there is any dip in our, in our Army um, because I leave, I have failed um, as a leader in the United States Army. So I have a lot of things I'd like to achieve. What's great about our Army, if I'm doing what's right, then those things are going to get accomplished whether I'm there or not. 
we set it on a path to get those things done. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff I'd like to yeah, get that done. Um, but uh, for everything that we've worked on, if it just ends and goes away and stops because I'm there, then I honestly, I believe that I should have never been doing it. Um, but there's some simple things. I want to really complete the Army Body Composition Program uh, and get that finished. We got the 540 Army Directive signed out. We're trying to get some other things. We're trying to bring back uh, Land Nav and our Basic Leader course. I'm going to rephrase that. We're bringing back Land Nav and our Basic Leader course. It's going to happen. It's already started. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> so uh, it's coming. I don't know why we took it out, but you took it out. It's your fault. So <laughs> somebody has to be That's blamed. Right. In this group. Well, you, you gave me great comfort with your statement. My <laughs> yeah. success was yeah, yeah, if, yeah, if yeah, you were better than me. So yeah, there, you right, so. there you go. There you go. So there's a lot of things. Um, bringing uh, back some training back in our basic leader course. Some uh, not training. Um, taking them back to the field. We're going to bring uh, you know little things like sleeping back in the field. Uh, some of those a little bit more lethality um, back into the basic leader course. But I've got a laundry list of uh, stuff that uh, we talk about all the time. There's just a couple I just keep going like you know even on the modernization I know we got Brian Hester here um, we just shot the 6.8 rifle next generation squad rifle it is really good um, you know I, I usually wear glasses when I'm shooting long range when I can shoot the 300 meter target uh, every time and it's really simple you've got the right rifle um, it's really good. And so um, what's coming out, just not um, from a perspective of what we're doing in the NCO Corps, but some of the lethality uh, from an AFC perspective on soldier lethality is, is really looking good. Um, so I'm really excited about all that. Excellent. All right, let's go out to our audience SMA. And uh, again, Christine, she has comment cards. If you don't want to walk up to a microphone, you can grab one of those from her and she will bring them up to me. Or please grab the microphone. And uh, I'll tell you, it always stands true. The first person asks a question, these forums is usually the best looking, smartest person in the room. And I know we're not going to be failed today on that aspect. So who has the first question for the Star Major of the Army today? I think every room needs like a Dave Bass. The best looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, um, gentlemen, uh, Sergeant Major Richardson, 516. Can you take like two steps yeah. forward because you're like behind a column of whatever? <laughs> yeah. I prefer not to use the mic, but um, for the audience. Um, but SMA, um, one of my questions is we talked about resourcing and for you know the Indo Pacific and the role of the NCO. Um, a challenge I found here over the last two years is getting that senior NCO leadership. I have uh, spoke to HRC as well as our senior leaders, but. It's not uh, the number of senior NCOs, it's more of the EFMP process. And my recommendation was if we could do the screening prior to the selection. So what's been happening is, for example, um, I have a unit in Japan that is one of six master sergeants and about to be uh, zero of six. Um, with that, though, we've had some people come on the gains for inbounds, but they fall off because they don't meet the EFMP criteria. Some of the challenges are because we go through other services um, unlike Army, then they don't meet the criteria. So when we talk about you know the Pacific being a priority theater and bringing resources here, um, what are some uh, things we can do to improve the manning and being able for the selection process, especially with ASCII M and EFMP? Oh. Okay. I think there are like eight parts to that question. <laughs> so, and I, I think, just give me a thumbs up if I answer them all, I guess. But because you, you did talk about the exceptional family member program and, and then talent. This actually came up at the pre-command course is we could do that screening, but some people don't want us to. I'll, I'll, and I'll be very clear is that maybe um, you are you know, selected to be a battalion command team in the Indo-Pacific and your family does it, you know, past the screen. You may want that assignment. And that's actually what came up. It's like, well, if I screen you all out, because hey, you can't go to that. So that might be your dream job. I always wanted to do that. My family will stay because I always wanted to be in this. I want to be in Hawaii in that unit as a battalion commander, or sergeant major, or first sergeant, toon sergeant, whatever it is. So this has actually came up. Do we just screen everybody out? Nope, you can't go. Your family can't attend there. Um, so that's a, a caution we have is that that's why we put people on assignment and then we do kind of do the screening. What we have to do as an army is do better and faster at the screening. 
And so we have the Enterprise Exceptional Family Member Program. And what we're finding is, is that people haven't put their families into the program. It's on the internet. It will actually, it's a web-based, you can go ahead and apply. And they, they will wait until they're on assignment. And that slows it down. Um, so on the EFMP side, um, I would say it's a caution that we don't screen out. Uh, it's more of a screen that you can go to the assignment because some people may, I always wanted to go to that assignment. And then on the other side, you're saying all the resources in the Indo-Pacific to do everything. Um, that's hard, is that most people think the Army has unlimited funds, but we don't, right? So we have to put things in certain places and sometimes we can't give everything to everyone everywhere. And, and that's probably normally what happens on, depends on where you go in a priority assignment, is I can't build a hospital everywhere you go, so we're gonna have to make that a restricted assignment. Um, now, as for talent, your, your SAR major, well, if it's in Korea, Rob, and both of the SAR majors are right there, is we have to make sure that we incentivize those priority assignments so you do have talented folks there. We've talked about this in our, some of our solution summits and our Manning, uh, especially when we looked at Indo, PACOM, or Korea, actually specifically um, when we're looking at first artists and how do we get a first artist. So we said we're going to have more first artists come out of the Sergeant Major Academy. <laughs> so. Um, it maybe didn't make all the master sergeants in the Sergeant Majors Academy uh, excited, but um, we wanted to train them to be Sergeant Majors, but um, we didn't have a requirement to fill those Sergeant Major positions, so we, we reprioritized that if they're going to, we want to have a higher number come out of the academy, they may not be selected for Sergeant Major, wanted them to go be first sergeants, and we'd put them over in Korea. Um, so giving them a, a really talented, seasoned master sergeant for some of those jobs that, you know, are in the Indo-Pacific. And that's, where, that's how we're looking at talent. But it's usually working with either the USERPAC, 8th Army, I know Jackie Love's in the back, so it depends on who you're looking for, and that's how we look at talent. Okay. So just the last part, SMA, so for the, we have personnel that want to come to, for example, Japan, but because they don't meet the screening, um, so kind of like what you were saying about command teams, so there are seniors that are selecting it, getting on assignment, but then other services um, are doing the screening and they're not meeting the criteria, even if they're willing to leave their family back. So that's what we're trying to figure out a piece. And my, my battalion sergeant major there is working with the, the Navy facility there to ask those questions to see if we as an Army can screen them so they are able to fulfill that assignment and we have the senior population we need. Okay. Well, that's fair. I think what you're talking about is it's not really screening. It's, I think it's called that weird thing called leadership. That's kind of how I see this, is that um, there's a senior sergeant major. He's around here somewhere. I'm not going to talk about him. Uh, he was told that he couldn't go on that assignment for exceptional family member. And that was inside. I think it might have been a joint base. I said, okay. And took a little leadership and make a phone call. So don't when you're looking at talent and if you feel like this is the right person and we even found in this case like they have the facilities and we needed to apply leadership and i'll caution you all is that on a grander scale sometimes we have this thing called policy and we don't apply leadership with it and i call that nothing so you can write all the policies you want and if you don't have a leader that's willing to take an action on the policy you'd actually do nothing um, so uh, when I found that you want to make up for if you got a person that really good person that's the right fit going to the right location apply some leadership and we'll get them to the right spot SMA uh, we do have one written question from the audience that I didn't stage this and I opened with a joke saying that we've never had a forum without talking about ACFT so are you kidding me I don't believe we that. are oh, we're, we're talking about it <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got asked this question um, I thought this is trust into a Pacific and, uh, uh, so. I, 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 I should give credit to the to the author of the question Paul, you gotta ask the question right after this that's right save us. Lieutenant Colonel McKenzie Kim. says is there any chance we can do the two-mile run up front the first event so you can get his legs warmed up before he has to do all the drags and things like that. No. No. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh, you want more than that? No. Yeah. <laughs> no again? All right, I think we have uh, so for it's one more. It's designed that yeah. way, one more uh, you know, it's for all the right reasons. Yeah. Is 
the reason we extended the time um, was because you do five events before you get to the sixth event being the run. So uh, it's designed um, to test endurance. And if you reverse that, and believe it or not, that was the same thing with the old APFT. You were not allowed to do the run and push up sit ups because your hip flexors on the sit up were actually stressed. And that's the why you had to do sit ups first and then do the run. So the science in, is a little bit behind it, not just the Army, the Army told you no, or you can go with that. You have two choices. A, <laughs> there was some signs behind it, or B, I just told you no. <laughs> All right, final question. Go ahead. Uh, SMA, uh, Sergeant Major Bennett, I'm the Theater Information Advantage Detachment Sergeant Major out here in the Pacific. Um, so within the, the structure of the Army, you know, we've really kind of put a focus on what you've talked about with leadership and trust and, you know, making soldiers into leaders. Um, but the simple fact is not every soldier is a leader. Uh, and with the technical structure of how we're going forward with a, a lot of our forces, you know, we've experienced a lot of loss of uh, soldiers to the contracting side for the technical side of, of what we need for, you know, cyberspace, EW, uh, things like that. And as, uh, you know, the lead for information advantage, that's really impacting how we conduct business and how we spend money on the contracting force. Uh, has, has the Army at your level, or, or have you thought about, you know, looking at a more specialized function of, of NCOs that maybe aren't leaders, uh, just like some lieutenant colonels will never be battalion commanders, and they're great staff officers. There are some NCOs that are not great leaders, but are fantastic at the more technical side of what we need in the Army and how we progress for land power uh, here in the Pacific. Yeah. It's actually a really good question, um, and yes, I've thought about it a lot. The Army had a model like that, and we used to have a spec, I think it went to seven, I may even went eight, I'm not sure. So we had that model, we got rid of it, and we're not gonna go back to that. Um, but the way I answer it is yes, kind of, but it's really tied to pay. I mean, we had some highly technical folks, and what I'd like to see in the future is that you come in and you do get this highly you know, specialized skill, but you may have steps in there. So you could say, hey, you're a, a, a 17 Charlie, a cyber warrior. You may not need to be, you know, the Sergeant Major of the Army, but you know, you may want to be really good in your field and do we, can we incentivize that through some pay? And I, I just want to remind everybody in the room that the nobody in the Army or DOD controls your pay scale. <laughs> so that is, that is the responsibility of Congress. And I, I just, and I'm not influencing, I'm just informing is that if there were a recommendation is how we would look at how we incentivize those through pay so that you get somebody who's highly technical but wants to stay, but we can still somehow incentivize them through some pay scale. So if we just took away the rank and just made them a, you know, a specialist and let them stay longer, but they're really good, you know, but those highly technical fields are really usually really sought after. So that's how we really have to resolve this problem. And it's not just by changing the NCOs. I think you make a sergeant, um, you know, I, I don't see a need to make it spec, you know, spec five. Just make him a sergeant, give him, give him a little bit of leadership. You know, the lieutenant colonel doesn't have a different rank. You know, still look like a lieutenant colonel, um, but they may not be in charge of that. But there needs to be a pay incentive that goes along with that for those highly technical skills, and that's what all services have been looking at. And that's when you know, Sergeant Major Marine Corps, Chief Master Sergeant Bass, um, you know, the MCPON, we've all kind of agreed. And the way to go after that, it's called the Quadrennial Defense Review of Military Compensation, and hopefully, that what comes out of that is a recommendation to, to fix the skill. Okay. Thank you, sir. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we were blessed to have you here for just a few moments. SMA's got a lot of things to do while he's here on the island because we've got a, a large organization out here that's working with our coalition partners to defend the freedoms and protect the liberties of both, both us and, and our coalition partners. So, SMA, thanks for blessing us for your time. Let's give the 16th SMA a big round of applause. <laughs> Now, don't go away. We're going to take a short uh, break as SMA departs, and we're going to set up for our panel, which is next. So please take a couple-minute break in place as we get set for our second part of the Senior NCO Forum, our non officer panel. Thank you, oh, SMA. Awesome. Thanks. Cool.